So my name is Lori Grace. I'm the executive director of the Sunrise Center, and I'm very honored to be here. Walk, walk a little further into the room, guys. <laughs> With Cliff Arnebeck and Bob Petrakis. Uh, they are attorneys that I've been working with since 2004. And Bob is also the, uh, uh, to, to deal with election fraud, and they, they together have put forward a number of lawsuits and they will talk about this topic. And Bob, you're also the uh, director and producer of the Free Press and uh, different things. And a lot is going to begin to come out with this. And uh, we also have, um, some people have been concerned about election integrity here in the audience, and Emily Levy, if you would stand up for a moment. She has been involved with uh, working for a long time. Say, say to the audience what you have worked on. So I first was working with Bob and Cliff in, after the 2004 election. They're, they're both located in Ohio, and even though I was in California, I was working on the investigation into what happened in the presidential election there in Ohio in 2004 and then worked with a group called Velvet Revolution on a number of elections in several states since then and most recently was supporting a group in Arizona that you may have heard filed a challenge to the primary election there. And Emily also worked with me on 2008 yeah. and uh, uh, in, in 2008 on Proposition 8 which was actually stolen and we discovered what company was working on it it was the same one that was working to steal the 2004 presidential election. And uh, so there's a lot of interesting history we'll expose you to. And we're also um, going to go forward with uh, what's happening now and what can we do now. So what, um, are there any other people who've been involved with election integrity specifically here? Yes? Uh, why don't you raise your Tell us who you are. First Adrian, Adrian Bankhead. Um, I got involved in um, volunteer kind of exit poll in 2008, where we found uh, of, um, counts um, for Proposition Eight uh -huh. that were not consistent with the number of people. The flip was just statistically impossible. And I never knew what happened to that data, and I hope that it got to you. Um, but um, I'm, I'm gonna feel like I'm meeting other people. I never knew what happened to the. It was something we did like last second, and then the group broke, you know, like you know, just broke apart. So it's I'm glad to hear okay, that people were. Proposition eight was giving gays the right to marry, and the Mormon Church got together behind the scenes with. Mike Connell's uh, company, uh, um, what was it called again? Uh, oh, New Media. New Media. And um, they gave $200,000 to New Media <coughs> to adjust the, the, um, the vote totals. And I was studying them along with Steve Freeman. And that's a different time than now. In 2008, I went to the head of Courage Cam Campaign and Equality California, and I told them it, what was going on, but they had decided that that election fraud couldn't really be happening, and they wanted to focus on getting gays together as a minority group. And I want you to know that this is the first year that really we're being able to get significant parts of the public interested in election integrity because it's been too painful for Americans to recognize that there are people regularly trying to steal their elections and regularly hacking into them. And so um, with that, I, I want to begin. But um, how many of you here have, um, I, just to uh, ask you, how many of you here have uh, been convinced that the 2004 presidential election was stolen? Raise your hand. Okay, so quite a few of you, um, no. <laughs> and it's fine. So we're going to tell you some stories from behind the scenes and uh, go from there. But first, um, I'd like to show um, a YouTube. I got involved in 2003 when I read, saw the film Unprecedented, the, the year 2000 election. 
and I started, uh, I, I, well actually I met the filmmakers and I invested in their film and then started working with Bev Harris and Steve Enzo, wherever he is. Steve, raise your hand. Actually, you've been involved in election integrity. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, kind of got me into it. So what happened in 2004 during the election is I and Bev Harris, we all knew it was going to be stolen. And we just watched it go in. We watched her film, put out many freedom of information requests and we knew it was happening. And then we saw all the Democrats all depressed and looking to understand, um, you know, what was happening and also trying to understand the Democrats versus the Republicans and the psychology of how to reach out to the public and these things. But we actually knew it was machines all along, okay, that was really doing the whole thing. And um, uh, so anyway, I got involved in something called Audit the Vote, trying to get the uh, Kerry to accept that uh, he really did win the election, but he didn't want to do that, and um, gradually got deeper and deeper into that. Um, in 2006, I introduced Stephen Spoonamore into the, uh, who is a Republican, who was, became later a whistleblower, and we're going to let you know why Obama is likely to have succeeded because of Stephen Spoonamore, someone some of you may not have ever heard of. And uh, we're going to show a little um, film of him, and then we're going to go on deeper into our history after showing one or two little shorts of, of the present time. I, just, I, I have a burning question, and it's jumping ahead, but it's okay. so... I'm so concerned about it. What the Bernie Sanders inner group, are they dealing with this voting thing? I mean, have you guys been in touch with them? Yes, we met with them at their office and, and, and with the Oakland office. But I have to say that... They're in denial. Uh, some of them. They're, they're, they're election protection attorneys. Off the record, know exactly what's happening. No, I did that. In fact, uh, I sent them a memo before Ohio, uh, and also warned them in Arizona fairly, and also told them there was huge uh, stripping going to go on in Brooklyn. I mean, this stuff was was an open secret. It was being discussed uh, all all over the internet because every single one of these tactics was used in Florida in 2000 in Ohio in 2004 from the shorting of the machines, uh, which they used in Franklin County, but to the uh, mass stripping. They stripped 305,000 voters in 2004 in three cities, Toledo, inner city of Toledo, Cleveland, and Cincinnati, uh, areas that were voting 90 to 95% Democratic. So all of this stuff has been seen before I think the Sanders campaign initially uh, was somewhat naive because in Vermont, uh, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen those type of ta uh, tactics. So they know what's going on. The broader question is uh, who's doing it, right? Uh, I mean, we know who benefits from it, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, exactly who's doing it. And in some cases we know because it's the Democratic Party regulars within the party. Uh, and in Brooklyn we know it's a Republican clerk who took an old-fashioned bribe, right? Uh, a superdelegate from Clinton uh, bought property, you know, for $5 million over the value that wasn't on the market, that had been on the market earlier. So we know what happened there. That was old-fashioned bribery uh, of a clerk to purge 126,000 Bernie voters. Uh, you know, who, uh, and the Clinton campaign in Arizona, of course, actually joined in on the suit when, when you short the machines by 70%, yeah. uh, you know, in the key area, uh, in the Phoenix area where 60% of the voters are, I mean, you know, it, you know who it's going to hurt. So they know what's going on. The broader question of them, uh, and Bernie has spoke repeatedly about the stripping. You know, my, my book is the strip and flip, right? Is you can't have the flip, uh, it, which is often only about three percentage points, three to five, it's got to be plausible. The only way you get there is with the massive stripping 
of the voting to, rolls. Uh, I mean, you're, you're stripping people from the rolls. You're, uh, and this is the question I, I would pose to people here. Why in a computer era where states require IDs, Ohio allows 17 types of IDs, why would you deregister anyone from the voting rolls? Right? There's not enough room on the computer to keep a name there. I mean, uh, it really makes uh, no sense uh, to do this stuff. But that's what they're doing. And, and at a certain level, everybody knows. The question is, if you call the American vote into question, you're immediately a conspiracy theory, you're an American, uh, you know. I mean, essentially, the new slogan I've come up with is trust but don't verify. Because that's what, the, that's what they're telling us. Right? Trust but don't verify. And faith it's a faith-based voting, right? <laughs> push the button and pray. That was another one that comes up with these great one-liners. <laughs> so they're not, they're not, they're kind of putting their heads in the sand about it. Well, the question is what are, you know, uh, exactly uh, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, you've got 11 now of 26 elections that if they weren't in the United States, our uh, State Department would be investigating for fraud, right? Yeah. Uh, 11 of the 26 are so statistically outside the margin of error that under our State Department's protocol, we would, we would call them, be investigating them as fraudulent and wouldn't recognize the result. Uh, and What's again, the 26? Uh, the, the 26 primaries. Uh, uh, not the caucuses, right. but the primaries. And in 24 of the 26, there's been a shift towards Hillary Clinton, uh, not, not always uh, significant to the point of obvious fraud, but outside the margins uh, of error, which suggests uh, that somebody or a machine or an algorithm or a maintenance person or a technician or the 12 to 20 other ways you could easily tamper with these machines, right? These machines are 12 to 20 years old, right? And so on the, on the front, in the New York Times will say, well, no one would tamper with these machines. And on their front page will say, somebody hacked the CIA director's email today, right? right? Mm -hmm. Apparently you can hack this email, <laughs> you know, the Pentagon and the CIA, but a 20-year-old computer with, with, no, uh, with no security could never be hacked. The, the question That's here... Terrible. Uh, Bernie Sanders, what is his job as a candidate for president of the United States? It's to win. Right. And what has he been doing? Winning. Right, exactly. He has been gathering huge crowds, and he's been winning the primaries. Right. right? right. And, he, and if he were to take the blinders off and focus on getting across that line, winning, doing the things he needs to do as a candidate, and instead say, well, I'm going to... I'm going to investigate these, irre uh, these irregularities. There seems to be crime going on. That's the job of the Attorney General. That's the, jo that's the job of public integrity groups and, and acting as private Attorney Generals occasionally to, to uh, file lawsuits. He's doing the right thing to win. He's doing his job. It's our job to motivate the authorities and to do the litigation that needs to be done to stop the fraud. Great. That's great. Thank you. I just want to say just before that, and that's one of the reasons why we're stepping forward this work, uh, this election, because there are so many instances where it seems like unfairness has occurred. And actually there's a tremendous amount of energy in, in Bernie supporters. And if we can use that energy to be able, be able to get Bernie supporters moving towards constructive actions like participating in an exit poll, which we're organizing for California since they canceled the exit polls because they noticed that we were noticing that the differences were happening. If we can get that in terms of volunteers and money, and if we can support the lawsuit, and I'll bring to that We'll discuss that a little later, um, we can start making a difference. And this is the first time in since I got involved that there is substantial interest in this topic. And, what, and you know, there has usually been a tendency to feel overwhelmed and to compartmentalize and to try to keep on living life. So, yeah? I don't know. 
first I want to say, Lori, I, I've honored you for many years for what you've done in this area. As a journalism major at New York University from 1960 to 62, I was part of a group that actually I witnessed, get ready for this, how U.S. Senator John Kennedy did not legally win the election. Vice mm -hmm. President Richard Milhouse Nixon won the election. It was um, scandalous uh, that Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., along with the boss, Mayor Richard J. Daley Sr., I watched how they took the same people to the polls after breakfast. They voted in the, in the, in the ghetto in Chicago near my home. Then they bring them, they give them a free ham. They bring, pick up the same people at lunchtime, bring them back to the precinct. Right. They vote, <laughs> give them a roast beef after dinner, a baked ham. So uh, Kennedy, I interviewed him as a journalism major at New York University. Uh, Senator John Fitzgerald mm -hmm. Kennedy, but I got to say the documents clearly show he was not legally elected. President of the United States, uh -huh. which broke my heart, but the documents show that. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to like. comment on that, the yes. way John uh, or Robert uh, uh, Kennedy Jr. responded to this very point. Uh -huh. He said if, that was, if there was fraud in that election, it should be investigated and, and, and prosecuted. People that committed it prosecuted. Yeah. Now there are there is a there are I'm told and I've not personally investigated as you have. There were no computers, back. but I'm told that that, that there that there's a counter argument that, that while there was that stuff going on, it was not determinative of the election. That's another question. Well, Illinois no, was the key. To no that. question. Let's stick in present be. time. Yeah. yeah. So I want to um, have us start with the first thing. As I said in 2006. I brought Stephen Spoonamore into the investigation of elections, and he's just a very um, powerful person, and I, I'd like you to hear this YouTube. Well, I also want to let you know that I learned from Cliff that he is actually, uh, was a Republican, but became briefly a Democrat to vote for Bernie. <laughs> and that was funny. As an independent, but I want you to see who he is. And as I said before, the Obama election is uh, in 2008 was partly a result of his actions. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, if you look at the history, uh, the original uh, technology, uh, there's been questions made about the technology since 1964, when a guy named Roy G. Saltman, who worked for the Bureau of Standards, says, we, should we be counting a third of all the votes uh, as a central tabulator with a mainframe computer? Doesn't it pose problems? And he wrote a report in 64, 68, 72. Uh, and actually, there was a national security director from Ronald Reagan when he became president and said, look, there's tremendous vulnerability. So they've known about I'm the problem. I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican. I have... I worked on Giuliani's campaign, I worked on Bloomberg's campaign, I worked on John McCain's campaign. I've been a lifelong member of the party. This is not a Democrat-Republican issue. This is not a partisan issue. This is a democracy issue. If you actually care about a constitutional democracy in which each person votes, that vote is validated, and the people who end up in office are reflected on the basis of the way people voted, you care about this issue. If you don't want people to vote, if you don't want people's vote to count, and if you want to rule without owning it by a mandate, then you are very supportive of Diebold. Well, Wally O'Dell has promised in an old fundraising letter to deliver. I I'm going to go. I'm going to go ahead is and it accept. Is a Republican issue? I mean, who's stealing the votes? If, if what you say is true, who wants to steal the elections? I, I, I certainly know that in all the statistical information. It seems that in every single bizarre circumstance where exit data, polling data, or informational data swings, it has all been in favor of Republicans, but not the sort of Republicans who I want to see in office at all. These are people who lie and people who cheat. That is not the conservative way. Conservatives conserve things. We are respectful and we are constitutionally based. You know what the real problem is? 
people do not want to believe that people want to steal elections in this country. I've done extensive work over the years for voting monitoring overseas. If we had a variance in the exit polling of even 2% from what actually was tabulated, which is exactly how the Orange Revolution came about in Ukraine, we would be in there explaining to people something is wrong. We have had numerous elections in this country now in which where you use Diebold election system machines, the what happens with the vote is way off, 5, 10, as much as 12 percent from the exit polling and the actual survey. These statistical numbers are impossible. And the problem is Americans do not want to believe that we have people stealing our elections and they must come to the realization there are people in this country who want to steal elections and we must stop them. The company he worked for and founded was the foremost expert on credit card fraud. He's worked for the Justice Department, the FBI. He's one of the foremost experts and the on the Pentagon. And the Pentagon. And he played a major role in, in stopping um, you know, a computer fraud in many different places. And in fact, the Diebold system, which was also used by ESNS, the company was owned by two brothers, um, was designed by somebody who had a background in computer fraud and actually went to prison. You, correct? Uh, yeah, one, one of the people that worked on it. Uh, but two brothers, uh, that uh, the Erosevich brothers, uh, one went to Diebold, one went to ESS, and they used the GEM software, General Election Management software. Which we use in Marin. Uh, which we now know uh, doesn't just use prime plus one, one voter, but also it's weighted and can count votes in fractions, which makes it really easy to say when it hits 100, give Bernie nine-tenths, give Hillary 110. Uh, I mean, it's built into the software uh, itself. Uh, and the software is actually designed for fraud, is that uh, it doesn't, uh, it tabulates it doesn't add up the precincts to match the county total. They're two separate transactions. And no one's been able to figure out why you would do that. So you can have every precinct right when you check it, but the county total is actually wrong. Wow. Well, all right, so we'd like to move on to 2012, and then we'll move on to 2016. Uh, is in New Hampshire, uh, and they were using Shooptronic machines. Darn good machines. Ransom Shoop only got uh, convicted twice for election bribery in Philadelphia. He wasn't that. They later renamed the machines Danaher's because the guy who invented them uh, was involved in vote stealing, stealing elections uh, in Philadelphia. But uh, it was brought in by John Sununu into Manchester, the largest city, uh, in the primary. Bob Dole is running. He's up by eight points in the tracking polls for the election. And you saw a tremendous upset, uh, is that uh, Bush wins by nine, although the last poll shows Dole winning by eight. A 17-point shift. Bob, also the exit polls showed, showed Dole winning. Yes, yeah. the exit polls, wow. which would have uh, indicated fraud in every other country but the United States. And here we got good reason. The universal laws of statistics do not apply on U.S. territory. They just apply on Earth and the rest of the universe. So what happens in that election is the Washington Post says, there must have been a sudden grassroots surge, right? <laughs> Instead of saying, what about the fact you, you're using direct recording electronics with no paper trail, no verification, programmed by private uh, partisan for-profit companies using secret proprietary software. You must want your election stolen and hacked if you allow <laughs> private companies to secretly program your computers with no open source, with no audits. The system is set up to be ripped off, particularly when there's insurgents 
that are taking on very wealthy and powerful men if you look mm -hmm. at these companies. So someone, what's your name again? Adrian. I, I just wanted to, I mean, just following on what you're saying, i got to ask you this. I, do you think that, the, that losers don't talk about election theft because there are issues of classification? They have, you know, they've taken an oath to, you know, not talk about, you know, like that's a top... They'll, they'll, they'll lose their top secret security clearance yeah. if they talk about election theft because that's a core function of the state. Well, I actually think, you know, I've talked to John Kerry. I, I briefed him after 04. He knew. I mean, he yeah, talked about, he talk about, he uh, he talked about, about the machines, wherever those machines were used, the exit polls, you know, uh, didn't follow. I mean, Lou Harris, who, uh, who gave Bob Kennedy a brilliant interview, right? sort of the father of, of modern exit polling, uh, said Ohio was the dirtiest election perhaps in American history because the exit polls deviated so much from, uh, from what uh, the actual vote count was. Uh, what year was that, please? 2004 in Ohio. And, and there's a whole... Uh, I, I think people don't want to be uh, accused. Right now I'm in the battle with the nation who accuses me of being a conspiracy... Theorists. Well, where does the conspiracy theorist come from? It comes from people. It comes from the CIA saying that. Right. No, you know, absolutely. I, yeah. Absolute so that's what. That's exactly why I asked the question. That memo was written that says that you can charge that. I mean, uh, and it's such an odd term, right? Because they're coincidence theorists, right? They think, okay, wherever you're using machines with no paper, the exit polls happen to be off seven percent of the vote, but where you actually have a countable paper trail. Uh, they're within the margin of error. Uh, in this election, the exit polls... Has that been studied uh, closely? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's... You know, they'll, they'll say that there's no... Uh, by closely... What, uh, well, there's a seven, if you go to freepress.org, there's a 17-page paper written by me, statistician Ron Bayman and Pete Pekarski, an attorney, where we actually found two phantom precincts that occurred when you inserted the flash drive into the central tabulators. We actually counted wow. the Scantron machine, ES and S models, uh, 800. So you've got these two machines. But you're we're used counting. in California significantly. Uh, they, they work fine. Now when you take the thumb drive out, uh, and if you just Google malware, you'll see what uh, They walk over to the central tabulators. There's two machines, one, two, and each of them have six precincts. One of one, the absentees early voting. Two of one, same thing. Uh, and then, you know, there's one of two, one of three, one of four, one of five, one of six. But when you put in the flash drive, you created a new one known as one of seven and two of seven, which produced 2,500 votes, uh, overwhelmingly 70% for George W. Bush. Wow. And Miami County election officials who were cooperating with us, they were Republicans, because they thought we were crazy conspiracy theorists and they wanted to show us what assholes, then apologized and admitted that somebody had programmed their computer wrong to create a two phantom precincts. Well, and, now, and the algorithm in those precincts is the, uh, the precincts that compiled into seven uh, is that they had higher numbers uh, and higher turnout. It's almost like there was an algorithm that based those votes on the size of the precinct. It was obvious to any critical Did observer the that the yeah. 2000, it was obvious to any critical observer that the 2004 presidential election was stolen in Ohio. All right, so John Conyers, then chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, sent a letter to the FBI. <coughs> Justice Department. Justice Department. One of the two, the yeah. same, two uh, fundamentally the same. And they commenced a criminal investigation. All right? December of... And they found evidence of fraud. Changing ballots by the... Oh, by box, box loads. They... Carl Rove sends a person from... A, a protege of his from FBI headquarters to take over the office of the Cincinnati uh, CIA, which, got, which controls the Southern District of Ohio. And that person, Stanley Borgia, 
close down the investigation and sent a letter saying, we have investigated and we have found no evidence of crime. All right, so here's the, 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 the top investigative authority saying there's no evidence of crime. All right, so now Kerry is in a position where, you know, what are you, are you going to, are you going to say there's crime? Are you going to, uh, whatever? He, he goes along with the recount, but he did not participate in the, in the contest. And on the day that the challenge was raised in the House of Representatives to the Electoral College vote from Ohio, where was John Kerry? John Kerry was in Iran, I mean, uh, uh, was it Iraq, with the troops. And, and, he, and he told his colleagues in the Senate to not support this challenge. So that's his thought. It was structured. And, and, and part of it, he would have been attacked as a sore, sore loser man, right? That's the big that, thing. Uh, you know, you're crying foul because you lost. There's a whole campaign that is used against people that call uh, into question uh, uh, the vote. But it's, you know, it's been studied uh, repeatedly. In fact, they, we develop terms. There's a term called, uh, election officials will tell you they had to recalibrate a machine. That's a term that means the machine was recording wrong. Uh, in Youngstown, Ohio, they admitted 31 of their machines had to be recalibrated uh, later in the day. Why? They were flipping votes in that election uh, from Kerry to Bush. So, but they'll mention, they'll talk about recalibration as opposed to vote flipping, uh, which would be a more accurate term that people would understand. Okay, so I'd like to get back to a little bit more of the YouTube. The United States of America, a beacon of democracy. Well, it was, it was at one point at least. Now elections are full of fraud and burglary from party delegates to voting machines the Electoral College, elections have become a corrupted, convoluted system that's in dire need of repair. So to talk more about this broken system and why the media won't touch the issue of rigged elections, I'm joined now by New York University professor and author of the book, Fooled Again, The Real Case for Electoral Reform, Mark Crispin Miller. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Well, thank you for having me on, Abby. So with the elections coming up in less than a month, I wanted to dig right into uh, election fraud, which you've covered extensively through your research. Uh, you said that the Republican establishment media doesn't address the issue, but the, the alternative media goes out of their way to debunk the issue of rigged elections. So why is this such a taboo issue across the board? Well, I don't know. That's a very, very good question. In a way, that's the question. Why does the press, including the progressive media, uh, consistently either ignore or, or debunk uh, uh, very solidly based arguments and even observations about stolen elections. Why does the Democratic Party uh, also refuse to discuss the issue, even though they're the ones who are getting screwed by this? I, I don't know. We could speculate about it. It's probably something we should discuss in a whole separate segment. But the fact is that it is a taboo subject, despite uh, a massive amount of very, very precise evidence making quite clear that our elections have been uh, stolen mostly by the Republican Party uh, since uh, 2000 uh, through a combination of vote suppression, which is disenfranchising people uh, before Election Day, and then election fraud through electronic means, which is something actually new in the history of uh, election chicanery in the United States. So uh, you also, you just mentioned, you know, it's mostly the Republican establishment kind of rigging these elections. But I mean, I remember in 2004, the exit polls flipping after Bush winning. Kerry said, we'd have lawyers on the ground in Ohio, we'd count every vote. And then he gives this concession speech. And you said yourself, Kerry acknowledged that the election was stolen. So why, Mark, why did Kerry take a dive, Gore take a dive? I mean, they want to win, right? I mean, they're putting billions of dollars into these campaigns. Doesn't this suggest that they're completely Complicit in, in this establishment line as well? In the well, charade? In a, way, in a way, they're complicit, but I think in the case of Gore and, and Kerry, their complicity is a matter of a certain kind of establishmentarian mindset, you know? Uh, we have heard that Gore had a conversation with Jesse Jackson about the question of whether or not the 2000 election had been stolen, and he is reported to have said to Jackson, well, if, if this is all true, and, and if, if it was stolen, there's really no alternative to revolution. 
Well, I don't think Al Gore is a revolutionary. <laughs> uh, neither is John Kerry. I mean, he's you know got more money than God thanks to his marriage. Uh, these guys are, are seasoned inside players in D.C. So that when they're confronted with with evidence of something as as profoundly uh, scandalous and 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 really disorienting as the subversion of the election system, I, I think they can't go there. They're simply not able to go there. Now, now there are Democrats who who are clearly complicit because the big, huge private companies that that own and maintain the electronic voting system spread their money around, you know, to members of both parties. So I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all explanation for this silence, you know, whether that's just psychological denial, whether it's complicity, wh whatever it is, I, I think we, we have to agree, you know, that um, the election system, at the very least, needs to be radically uh, uh, reformed, uh, reformed in, in a kind of revolutionary way, uh, if only because there's no doubt that the election system could be uh, uh, subverted, could our elections could be rigged, and on this n nobody disagrees. We've had studies from you know a whole range of universities, from the government itself. Pretty much everybody agrees that that our our computerized election system is is very very easy to manipulate, extremely easy to manipulate. Uh, where it gets to the point where folks don't want to talk about it is, is when you come up with evidence that it has been used to manipulate elections and is being used to manipulate elections. At that point, people accuse you of conspiracy theory and change the subject. And they will talk about vote suppression, voter ID requirements, and things like that. They will talk about Citizens United. They'll talk about the floods of campaign uh, contributions that are being used to, you know, sort of wash away any kind of rational political discourse. These are important subjects, uh, don't get me wrong, but to talk only about them and to ignore the, the facts of uh, electronic election fraud uh, is, is, is to leave us extremely vulnerable as a democracy. Yeah, I mean, it's the elephant in the room, Mark. Like you just said, we talk about all the things that have to do with elections, the mainstream media 24-7, this whole charade and the scripted conventions and the debates. And all the while, I mean, the system's rigged from the top down. I wanted to talk about just the corporate-backed establishment candidates, the corporate-controlled media dis disseminating the message and marginalizing alternatives to the ballot boxes, to the voting machines, and then to the electoral college itself. I mean, what do you think about having a system in place Place, a rigged voting aside, rigged electronic machines aside, that you can win a popular vote but lose the election with the Electoral College. What do you think about just that? Well, that, look, I mean, if you, if you look back the history of elections in the United States, you can see that, that from the beginning uh, there's been a, a strong um, uh, animus against the enfranchisement of, of the people. You know, I mean, we call ourselves a democracy, but we've become a democracy really in spite of the, the preferences of, of, the, of the founding fathers. The Electoral College is, is one of, of many ways in which the, the system has been rigged against uh, popular self-government. That's a fact. Uh, and, and it's also true that there are way too many uh, profound similarities between the two political parties. That's all true. Uh, however, I think we have to understand that the Republican Party today is uh, uh, basically in the hands of an extremely radical uh, minority of very, very wealthy uh, people who are mostly radical libertarians, and that there's also um, a, a considerable component of theocratic Christianists who, frighteningly enough, have their hands on the um, very few huge private companies that, that manufacture and maintain our, our voting system. Uh, I, mean, I could get into details about this. Let me make the general point that when you start to realize that there is a kind of extremist faction that has uh, a lot of influence on the outcome of our elections, you realize that it's not necessarily helpful simply to emphasize the deep similarity between the two political parties. That is a fact. They are all too similar. 
but we're, we're also talking about something else. Sure. There are differences. There are differences between the parties. If, for example, Al Gore had been allowed to serve as president, and by the way, most Americans don't know that he actually won the election in 2000, when all the votes in Florida were finally counted, and the results were announced two months after election day, uh, sorry, two months after 9-11, uh, it, it came out that Gore had actually won by just a few hundred votes. I mean, despite all the vote sure. suppression and the rigging, he actually won. Now, if he'd been allowed to serve, you know, I, 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 I really strongly doubt we would have gone and invaded Iraq. I also strongly doubt that we would have ignored global warming, you know? So those are just a couple of significant differences. Sure, but Mark, the, but Mark, but who yeah. can we blame? Anyone but these people who concede and take a dive after right. they win. I mean, if they're I, spineless, I, I just I don't understand. I, I mean, yes, of course, there are significant differences domestically, right. you know, but I mean, when you're look, when you, yes, the Republicans may have hijacked this whole rigged system of elections, but I mean, geez, I really can't blame anyone else but the people who are letting it happen that have no spine. Oh, well, I completely agree with you there, Abby. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that. I mean, the people who roll over for that extremist uh, faction are, are just as much to blame as the faction itself. I, I blame Obama for not prosecuting Bush Cheney for war crimes, right? I mean, we could go down that road, and, and we go down hand in hand because <laughs> I completely, I completely agree with you. Uh, and 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 let's not let's not stop there in assigning blame. Okay, let's let's notice too that again the press, uh, that the corporate press, the New York Times, and the rest of them, and most of the progressive media, are equally to blame for treating this whole subject as conspiracy theory. You know, despite the fact that there is no end of evidence that this has been going on. Let me give you just one example out of many, and it's a pretty harrowing story. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, re-election victory of Bush Cheney in Ohio was arranged primarily uh, by um, a man named Mike Connell, who was Karl Rove's IT guru, very conservative, an extremely conservative Catholic, who did what he did primarily because he wanted to, in his words, save the babies. I mean, he was a radical anti-abortion activist, also kind of a computer genius. Now, he, he actually set up uh, a, a computer architecture for, for use in the 2004 election that uh, involved, uh, well, it, it's a system called man in the middle. And it's used by criminals often to you know, steal cash from financial institutions and so on. What he did was he set up a mirror site, uh, you know, uh, run through a computer in a basement in Chattanooga that allowed uh, outside uh, uh, actors to actually manipulate the vote count in Ohio. This is a fact, and, and the reason I say it with, with such assurance is that the contract that Mike Connell signed with Secretary of State Ken Blackwell uh, is, is publicly available, and in fact, it's on my uh, blog, News from Underground. So if people just go uh, to markcrispinmiller.com, they can read the contract that uh, you know, someone uh, yeah. provided and see for themselves that this mirror site was set up, and as, as computer expert Stephen Spoonamore has said, a Republican, by the way, that there is no other purpose to build such a site than to steal an election. Well, and you get into the details of what happened in Ohio on that night, you realize that uh, the exit polls had it right. John Kerry won that election. And let me simply agree with you again that <laughs> Kerry is to blame for rolling over. Also, his campaign uh, actually banked uh, millions of dollars to use in the event that the election was stolen. And not only has Kerry never addressed this publicly, and I'm not the only person he told privately he thought it was stolen, but they never spent a dime of that money in helping to expose that particular crime, which is necessary in order to get the American people to see that we have to do something about our election system. We have to get rid of computerized voting. We have to get rid of computerized vote counting across the board, period. Indeed. We, have to, we also have to forbid the participation of any private companies in our election system. Absolutely, that Mark. Not something that should be privatized. It absolutely has to be changed. It absolutely. Has to be changed as soon as possible, or we're, we're completely <laughs> screwed. It doesn't matter what Move On does. It doesn't matter how hard we Mark, to we have to. We're, we're unfortunately yeah. out of time. Time, but I, I okay. couldn't agree with you more. Um, I remember that right. day like it was yesterday. It was a terrible day for the democracy and, and everything else. Uh, thank you so much for your work.
all the elections rigged from the top down. Mark Crispin Miller, NYU professor and author of Fooled Again, The Real Case for Electoral Reform. Very important issues. Mark, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Folks, when it comes down to it, the elections are rigged. But it's not just the voter ID laws or other forms of disenfranchisement. It's the fact that we're given a false choice from the onset. It's the fact that the corporate media is complicit in pushing this false choice. And it's the Electoral College, an antiquated system that no longer applies to this society. So, even if we wanted free and fair elections, corporations control the process from the top to the bottom. And that's the set that we need to break. I want to just comment with Stephen Spoonamore. Um, Stephen Spoonamore talked about the difference of 2% and we'll be showing you the exit poll differences between Bernie and Clinton and, and how they're so much bigger. Is Spoonamore an elected official? Spoonamore is running for election right now, but he was a key person, which we want to show you in another YouTube, in the 2008 Obama <laughs> election and that we were all involved with stopping some uh, things that were beginning. But I want to say one thing that concerns me is that Paul Manafort was involved, he's an American who was involved with the stealing of the, uh, the Ukraine presidential election in 2004 and they were practicing for the American one in November and Paul Manafort is the top campaign manager for Trump. So, election issues are really of concern, and we may have to create another exit poll ourselves in November. That's what I'm wondering. So, you have a comment about Harvard? Oh, no. Uh, Laurie wanted me to remind people who haven't seen the study, the U.S. just came out of 47th out of 47 long-term democracies uh, for uh, a democratic scale. The University of Harvard and the University of Sydney, Australia, rated the countries in the world, and we essentially ended up last because uh, in the European Union, you may know, it's the function of government to actually register people to vote as opposed to strip them in massive numbers from the voting uh, rolls. So we're the only one that does this mass deregistration. Uh, and it, it makes uh, no sense. Between the 2004 and 2008 election in Ohio, we documented at the Columbus Institute for Contemporary Journalism, 1.25 million voters were stripped in that state. Uh, and uh, the Obama campaign, which officially had nothing to do with my institute, it's nonprofit, but I made the, I made the uh, data available, and they uh, actually had a guy virtually sleeping at my house every night going over the data and re-registering these voters. Shockingly, almost all of them came from the inner city. None of them were from rural communities, which had up to 118 percent uh, voter registration. These were stripped out of Cleveland, the nine urban areas, Cincinnati, Youngstown, etc. So uh, our lack of transparency no other society would allow private companies to secretly count the vote. On what basis were they stripped? Oh, I, I can tell you, uh, it used to be there's a law that says you could strip somebody who hasn't voted in two federal election cycles. That used to be counted as eight years, right? A presidential and a congressional election was one cycle, and then the second cycle was the same, eight years. Now, <coughs> we, leave, we have... 50 state systems, the basis of Jim Crow, and we have 7,000. Not only do we have 5,000 counties, in many areas, the municipal governments do the registering. Uh, in many of, thus, in 7,000 uh, of these, uh, it's usually the state of Ohio leaves it up to the county board of election. Some county board of elections say that if you didn't vote in the last presidential election, the last congressional election, even if you voted in local elections, you have two election cycles. So uh, also under Ohio law in 2004, you had the right to challenge anyone you didn't think was who they said they are. So every, uh, every voter in Cleveland who is a soldier fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, this is known as the Buffalo Soldiers Purge. You challenge them. They had a perfect right to get their sergeant's permission and fly back and say, I am who I am. But instead they were stripped from the voting rolls. Also, the, a party 
can send you a note saying you're not who you are. So the Republicans sent out mass uh, challenges into mailboxes from the Republican Party. And shockingly, most of the black Dems yeah. saw it from the Republican Party and threw it in the trash. Hence, they didn't know they were supposed to show up uh, to prove who they were, and they were stripped from the voting rolls. And Diebold accidentally uh, stripped 10,000 people a couple weeks before the election. It was a computer glitch uh, that affected the inner city in areas that voted 90% for Kerry. It was, it was a computer thing. This is Steve Enzer who got me into this thing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to say, it seems like there's this incredible number of people who know about this and so few who are willing to do anything about it. It's like they're all, you know, feeding from the same trough, is that it? Um, I have to say, um, what happens, in 2004, when I said, people are stealing the election, oh, come on, nah, nah, okay? In 2008, when, for example, when I talked with, uh, um, let's see, uh, uh, Franken, Al Franken. I talked to him. I told him that Diebold was running his machines in his state and that he needed to be more careful about it. Luckily, we had got Mark Ritchie in there in 2006 at the Secretaries of State project. But, you know, and it's a fundraiser. And he was like walking away from me. Because a politician's job you know, I'm here to get you to vote for me. And I'm here to have you write me a big check. And, my God, I don't want to look like there's any kind of fraud happening because you might not want to write me a check. Okay? And so, so I wanted to let you know that. Then, you know, when I am, um, so I'm in a, a, you know, if I'm a television station owner, I'm looking forward to those millions and millions of dollars coming into my election and even in the primary oh my god and I get to send these put out these fabulous ads you know buy sell these ads to people because they know everybody's going to be watching okay and if I'm a television station I participate with other television stations and we hire this group this exit polling company called Edison and they uh, they do exit polls while people are voting, and they give people uh, some chance to uh, know how it's going early because Americans are so used to having everything instantly. And by the way, back in Washington's day, a presidential election took a week to determine the results. And then you also mentioned that some machines <laughs> showed results before. Uh, what was it? No, they, if you ever, they, they'll say, they, here's the official line, that the exit polls are not capable of predicting elections. We, in fact, of course, use them, we, the American, uh, the AID, right, the Agency on International Development. There's a 2011 book that goes into detail on why we have exit polls. And if you Google online, you'll find an unclassified exit poll for the U.S., where they went in and tried to figure out how much Putin was cheating by. But this year, didn't they show election results even before everything was No, they called election results without a single vote being cast. Uh, I'm watching Ohio, and CNN says Hillary Clinton has won. I'm looking, there's not a single vote, so I call up the Cuyahoga Cleveland <laughs> Board of Elections and say, what, have you released these election results on freepress.org? And they say, no, they'll be out in about 45 minutes. So officially, you can't use these exit polls, right? Uh, but they call elections without any votes in based on the exit polls. And here's the problem they have, is they won't release the unadjusted exit polls, and that's what uh, Cliff is an expert in uh, legally. They won't release them. Instead, they assume the machines secretly programmed are giving you the count. So they adjust them even if they make no sense. Well, Bernie, we're expecting to get 69% of white people. Well, maybe you only got 59%. Well, what do your exit polls say? Your exit polls would have a margin of error of plus or minus two or three 
is saying that that's not true. That, uh, again, there, there's no way logically, statistically, you can make that kind of adjustment. All you're doing is inverting the process and assuming the machines are right as opposed to the exit polls indicating fraud. Yeah, the the uh, public cannot be blamed because the public is not being told that the, that the votes are being flipped. They're not being told that there's fraud on a massive scale. Now let's, let's think if there was a fire in a city and no fire engines came to put out the fire, no, no police sirens. It's, we don't want to alarm people, so we, you know, we're, not, we're not reporting this, and it just burns out. And, but then the, the fire keeps going on and on and on. In, the, in this cycle, there's been fraud in every one except, every, every one, except one, Oklahoma. That the exit polls, the unadjusted exit polls, the pure exit polls showed there was massive fraud. That those exit polls show that Bernie Sanders is ahead now in delegates. Mm. All right, but the public has not been told. Mm. The exit poll results are being suppressed. Oh, can, can you can you show? Can, can, do you have a source for what the actual delegate count should be? It can be calculated. We've got we've got graphs. We'll show you. Can I can I say something here? Yeah. Because there's something that is Please. driving me crazy. Hi. You've got this huge body of data, which, if compiled, is overwhelming. If you took it in isolation, everything would be attacked as being an aberration, so you wouldn't have the national-wide message. Why? And you do this in part just to get the message out. You file it as a class action with the, the American people as your class. You'd never get the class certified, but you'd get enough press that you might be able to do something on a smaller basis. And right now, what's happening in America right now there's a huge body of plaintiffs' class action firms, which are little guys. It's not the Milberg Weisses of the world anymore, the Robbins Geller, which actually represent <coughs> of the of the world. These are people who are now coming up and doing little shots. There are people who would take a shot, even though you might not get the old Milberg Weiss types to do it, or the David Golds of the ancient past. It seems to me, if you got the message out that this is a nationwide, you know, population-wide fraud. You would be a lot better, even if you got you never got past your, your, your early motion practice, to get this issue before the people, because I don't think 90% of the world knows what you're telling us tonight. Yeah. Yeah, that's the intention of a group, a number of groups. But I'm saying, I, you know, if you want, I can get you to some people who could probably... What's your name? Bob Fries. Better known as Chandra Fries's husband. <laughs> oh, hi, uh, But I'm just saying, you know, I know these people, or a lot of them, and the ones I don't know I can get to. We are I'll get you, we are get you to them more actually. We're preparing such a suit. Good. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just, isn't there um, even professionally a lot of controversy over the accuracy of exit polls? And, um, you know, like, uh, I was reading Jonathan Simon's website, and he says right there in the front about um, the way that exit polls work, because I've been trying to learn more about this, because I feel like a lot of these fraud arguments about the computers are pretty much based on the sanctity of the exit poll. So I was trying to just get some historical reference about how accurate they are. And hold on, just let me finish my comment. And um, um, he says in on the website that that's a part of the exit poll is adjusting not just not just to match the machines, but in terms of demographics and weighting and all that stuff. So, sure, that's why you, know, that's you part of the statistical yeah, process. and that's why ethically you show your sample. It's a simple process calls his mister, which I, I wrote an article I to, to Holland, right? Is that, yes, here, here's the problem with any polls, but here's, a, here's exit polls, right? First, there's a history. There's virtually no historical, historical intervention between voting and walking outside and saying who you voted for. So you eliminate that. The next thing you look at, you're trained in social science, is to look at instrumentation. That's the I in the his mister that you teach in 101 stats. And that when you look at the instrumentation, you go, huh, we've got 20-year-old machines, some developed by crooks, that have private proprietary software with no open source and no audits. And you stop there and say, maybe that's the problem. 
But then you move on to the his is the sample. You look at the sample. Uh, the adjustment comes if when you're counting the people coming out in your random count, you're not getting uh, representation uh, of certain groups. But that's easy uh, to account for. It's not that complex. Those are minor adjustments that are actually factored into the mar margin of error. And in fact, what they do is they use a cluster effect uh, to deal with that, which actually expands by 30% the margin of error. So uh, they're assuming because of problems of sample, but they're not releasing their samples. If they were ethical, they would tell us. Uh, that's not how they're adjusting them. They're massively adjusting them, even when their representation is right, even when they've been randomized properly with, with random numbers, uh, and they're coming up with absurd results, and then they refuse to release those results because they know they're, they're absurd. Well, so how do you know that the sample was accurate in the beginning if they won't release it? They, because they actually initially publish their unadjusted codes. Uh -huh. That's what's been happening. Jonathan Simon right, got the first screen grab right. uh, on the unadjusted numbers, the actual reporting of the election, mm. before it was privately transferred to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Right? The 2004 election in Ohio was counted by a born-again evangelical Christian who got into IT named Jeff Averbeck for a company called SmartTech. A year before the election in 2003, the, the contracts on the freepress.org, they signed a contract if the supercomputers of Ohio fail for the first time in history, a right-wing company, mm. private company in Chattanooga in the basement of the old Pioneer Bank uh, building, who happens to also be a server farm for GBW43, Carl Rove's email out of the White House, the Swift voters who attacked Kerry, the Republican Party, are all in the server part. And then wow. in the state, who's doing the maintenance, designing the system? Michael Connell, born again right to lifer, one of the biggest contributors to Ohio Right to Life, and the Rapp family that developed the butterfly ballot and in, in that diverted votes from Gore in Florida and live in a bunker. They're one of the most well-known right-to-life radicals in the state. And I know that Reverend John Coates runs the right to life. I've known him for years because I interview him with the free press. He says, yeah, you know, it's interesting that these guys all got into IT. And all of them believe there's a higher moral law to save the babies. Right. And the Holocaust against the unborn, the, the votes in Ohio, the, the maintenance of the poll books, the voter databases where people suddenly find themselves in the wrong party or not on the voter rolls is being done by the right to life movement, by the Rapp family. Now, if Obama, if somebody, if Bernie, suddenly the Democratic Socialists of America all got interested in IT and all the election results, you know, were predicting this and Hillary was being screwed out of votes and a private company run by the Democratic Socialists of America was doing the programming for the computers, we would hear about it. It would not be allowed. Okay, I, I just wanted to say something, too. Um, as someone who took a little time to understand exit polls, because I didn't fully understand them, um, what happens is Richard Sharnan, who's noticed something called the red shift for the, at least the last 10 years, would take screenshots of the last flash before the votes are all counted. You know, and, mm. and we did that in uh, 2012. We had a group of people in the Bay Area watching the Ohio tabulator in 2012. They were all here for our uh, Wednesday time. And uh, this, this has helped me understand it. And what happens is the difference between the very last screenshot, and sometimes that's even after the polls have closed, and the vote totals that are announced is where the margin of error is is big, you know. I mean, the I mean, it's beyond the. Um, let's see, how do we say it? It's, uh, beyond, it's beyond the the, the what? It's beyond the margin. Yeah, it, it, beyond it, the margin of error. Significantly, yeah. three and a half to four deviations. Those of you who do so, you know, you're more likely to be a homo necrosophiliac. <coughs> 
than to get the results that you're seeing uh, for uh, for someone like Bernie in these elections. But as Bob pointed out earlier, in, in every other country of the world, this is this is an accepted fact that that the exit polls are a reliable indicator of the integrity of the elections. In Germany, for example, the the reported vote is always very, very close to the exit poll result, indicating that they have honest elections. In Ohio, where we had this exit poll discrepancy, and we had a complete investigation, ultimately, right down to the precinct level, right down to the actual ballots, in a book called Witness to a Crime. And Emily Levy right there was helping. The, the, uh, again, we, we showed that the exit polls were right. The reported vote was wrong. In three counties in Ohio, the ballots showed, and the, pre the precinct analysis showed, a hundred, over 100,000 votes were shifted from Kerry to Bush in just those three counties, and, 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 and approximating the margin of reported victory. But this was going on all over, all over the state, but in those three counties, uh, it was basically uh, stolen. And if you've got to look at uh, Bush wins in Ohio by about 139,000 votes. Just cleaning up the vote and counting 3% dropped him to 118,000 votes. If you would have recounted uh, the rest of the state, uh, the 3% recount showed a 6.5% pickup for uh, when the ballots were hand uh, counted. So you're in a situation where uh, the numbers, uh, you know, don't seem uh, uh, to match. And, and some of them were easy, right? The, the lows in Gehanna Ward 1B, 638 people voted, and Bush was awarded 3,700 votes. And we were able to figure that one out. On that, that gets to right, right there. Yeah, um, I, I would just like to mention one thing. Um, in 04, when uh, Bush uh, won against Kerry, and at 9 o'clock, Kerry was winning, and at a little after midnight, Kerry was losing, I happened to be aware of um, exit poll results that actually showed that Kerry was winning the following day, early in the morning. And there was uh, this big question about, well, how did this happen? And they assumed that Republicans were too shy to come up and say who they voted for. No, no, it's better than that. They were only shy in the last hour before the closing of the poll. They weren't shy in the morning, afternoons, early afternoon, <laughs> late afternoon. And not only were they shy, uh, and these were in Republican areas, where the literature shows that people are proud of the way they vote. Democrats in all Democratic areas. Uh, Republicans in uh, Republican areas. So the theory that Karl Rove proposed is that these women were hiding. They raced to the polls, and then they hid in the basement to avoid uh, exit pollsters. So I actually uh, did what investigative journalists did. I went down there and talked to the election officials and go, man, you guys must have been crazy with that huge surge right at the end. And they go, what huge surge? Uh, there wasn't no here. I go, do you got sign-in sheets? They actually have time sign-in sheets. No surge existed wow. on the sign-in sheets for the precincts all over Butler, <coughs> uh, Warren, and Claremont County. Those three counties provided the entire margin of victory uh, for George Bush mm. and were way off, seven mm. points off, what the exit polls had predicted. And wow. so, thank you, Just I just want to take one moment just to finish the whole thing. So what happened after that is I learned that Edison was not going to release any more raw data. And they were taking a really big stand on it. And as I've seen in following the money, as I said, if I'm a politician, I, I want your vote, I want your money, I don't want to show any election fraud. If I'm a TV show, as I said, I want the money, I certainly don't want to show any TV show because I want the Republicans and Democrats to give. If I'm an exit poll company like Edison, I want to keep on getting hired every every election year. You know, so I want to show something that cooperates with the electronic machines. And then the last thing, part of the whole cycle, 
is if I'm an election official, I've cho chosen a machine, I, I, I get courted by uh, vendors of electronic voting machine companies. They take me out to lunch, I, you know, maybe give me tickets to the ball game and things like that, and I get courted much like pharmaceutical companies court doctors. So I want to take a moment to take a stand that I made the right choice and this person was really honest, a good guy, okay? And, and so the thing is, is that I don't want to look like anything happened in my watch because I'm a good, you know, responsible election official and, and there are many people like that. But when you look at it, the whole cycle of how people make their money and survive depends upon this system which denies election fraud. So I just wanted to add that. And I Jay, know Jay Kenneth Blackwell, the Secretary of State, held stock in Diebold and was the co-chair of the Bush Cheney re-election campaign. And Catherine Harris, the Secretary of State in Florida, was the campaign manager for Bush in Florida. So we should start doing another little movie, huh? Yeah. Okay, now just before we start, I want to say Clint Clint Curtis is a programmer and he designed a system to flip elections. And the rest is listen to the story, and you'll hear Cliff's voice interviewing him. Mr. Curtis, would you please state your full name for the record? My uh, name is Clinton Eugene Curtis. And where do you reside? Tallahassee, Florida. And what is your profession? I'm a computer programmer. Would you please speak into the microphone so the audience can hear your testimony? I'm a computer programmer. Mr. Curtis, are there programs that can be used to secretly fix elections? Yes. How do you know that to be the case? Because in October of 2000, I wrote a prototype for President Congressman Tom Feeney at the company I worked for in Oviedo, Florida that did just that. And when you say did, did just that, it would rig an election? It would flip the vote 51-49 to whoever you wanted it to go to and whichever race you wanted to win. And would that program that you designed be something that elections officials that might be on county boards of elections could detect? They'd never see it. Mr. Would you answer that question once again? They would never see it. So how would such a, such a program, a secret program that uh, fixes the election, how could it be detected? You would have to view it either in the source code or you'd have to have a receipt and then count the hard paper against the actual vote total. Other than that, you won't see it. All right, Mr. Curtis, uh, if you had been asked, you or others with your professional expertise had been asked to design a protected program to, that would protect the Ohio elections from against, against such software to fix the election, could you have done so? If we'd been asked to make a program that can fix the election? Sure, anybody can do it. No, could you have designed a program or a procedure or a protocol that would have protected Ohio against this kind of rigging? No, you have to look at the source code. You have to get probably programmers from both or all parties to look at the source code and determine if there's anything in there that shouldn't be there. I mean, it's a simple program. You're adding one to a person's total. It's a hundred lines of code tops. There's all right, if uh, are you aware of whether there was any protective action in Ohio against this kind of vote rigging through software? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. You were, you were not asked to assist in the development of any protective system, is that correct? No, I was not. In Europe, have you uh, reviewed at all the election results in Ohio? No, I haven't. Okay. Given the availability of such uh, vote rigging software, and the testimony that has been given under oath of substantial statistical anomalies and gross dis dis differences between exit polling data and the actual tabulated results, do you have an opinion whether or not Ohio election, the Ohio election, presidential election, was hacked? Yes, I would say it was. I mean, if, you're, if you have exit polling data that is significantly off from the vote, then it's probably hacked. And your testimony is under oath? Yes, sir. And the testimony you've given is true? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman Stephanie Waters and I have the same question. Come back to the podium. Who did you
you say you were asked to prepare? I was asked by Tom Feeney. He's now a congressman. At that time, he was uh, Speaker of the House of Florida, Yang Enterprises, which was the company I worked for, lobbyist, and their corporate attorney. He wore a lot of hats. And at the time, he was the Speaker of the House of Florida. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Congressman. You say he was the, the lobbyist for the voting machine company at the same time he was Speaker of the House? I don't know what the voting machine company is. He was a lobbyist for Yang Enterprises. We had NASA contracts. And, and Yang Enterprises did what? Computers? Computers. Okay, and he was your lobbyist? Your he was the lobbyist for that company, yes. And he asked you to design a, to see, to design a code to rig an election? Yes. While he was Speaker of the Florida House? Yes. This was during or previous to the 2000 election? Yes, October, end of September. And did he ever express why he wanted a code to rig an election? No, I immediately assumed that they were trying to keep you guys from cheating them. So, <laughs> so I wrote up the documentation of what you would look for in the source code, how you would make sure that you didn't get you know, taken advantage of, make sure that all voting machines had receipts, because that way you could back count the ones that looked a little funny. And I handed it a paper. I received you mean a paper trail? Yes, paper trail. And I handed that in to Mrs. Yang and said, here's your report, here's your program. And she said, you don't understand, we need to hide the fraud in the source, in the source code. Hide the fraud, not reveal the fraud. Not reveal the fraud because it's needed to, con to control the vote in South Florida, was what she said. Whoa, That's what she whoa. said. That's what your, she knowledge, said. your knowledge, was this used? I have no idea. I, I was ready to leave, so, <laughs> so I retired and left the company. Your testimony a moment ago, I think you said just before you left and answered the Congresswoman Tubbs Jones question, that, would you just repeat what you said in terms of uh, the, the uh, exit polls? Oh, the exit polls should not be significantly different from the vote. And if they were, you would conclude what? I would conclude someone's playing with the vote. Now with the exit polls? That's possible too. Okay, something, I was ask why something you, is definitely skewed. Something is skewed in one or the other or both. Right. To select which one, you'd have to see where the problem is. Let me ask you one further question. Assuming for the moment that such software, that's what you call it, such software to, to rig a vote was used in one or more machines in Ohio or in Florida, could you today detect that if you looked at the source code? If you could get the machines and they have not been patched yet, I mean, once they get in and touch them, anything can happen. You can also set timers to do that, but then you see the timers. Then you'd have to take those machines, decompile them, which I couldn't do, but possibly a Microsoft, an MIT, something could do. You might, you might be able to see it. You might. Not, this is, depends on how good they are at destroying what they had. Destroying what they had by tamping the machine afterwards or by programming a, a destroy uh, instruction in the first place. Right, because since you didn't... Both, either or both? Either or both. You, you didn't actually see what's in there, so you don't know if the code is running in a single executable or running in various modules. If it's running modules, you can make the code actually eat itself. Let me ask you one further question. We, I have heard, I've been told, that people who assume that lots of the election results, or that a large fraction of the election results in any state may have been affected by uh, deliberate fraud in the computer are, are paranoid because the, in order to do that, you have to have access to thousands of machines and that, that would be readily detectable. To what extent is that true? It depends on the technology you use. If you did a central tabulation machine that fed in, all you'd have to do is set a flag. You set a flag, the central tabulation tab central tabulation machine would then flip your vote. So if you, so one person putting in bad code in a central tabulation machine could affect thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of votes. Right, and you could activate, and, you could activate either automatically or you could make it so that there's code existing on like an electronic machine that feeds it where you would punch it in, it would set the flag, the server would see the flag and then. And if you had a recount, uh, and there were no, like, no paper trail. Would that be, as soon as that, that had happened, would that be revealable by seeing a discrepancy between what the tabulator, central tabulator showed 
I want the individual machines which have not been tampered with, Joe? Not if I wrote it. Why not? In other words, in other words, I would make a match. You could you could work back from the tabulator to the individual machines, so the tabulator would tell the machines to switch their results. Yes, it talks both ways. You can flip it to whatever you need. And they actually did talk to each other. The, yes. the machines as long as they're hooked up, as long as it's networked together, they could talk to each other. So in other words, there's absolutely no assurance whatsoever on anything with regard to these machines. Absolutely none, unless you look at the source code and make sure it's safe before it goes out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Mathers. Uh, I know that Congresswoman Waters has a question, and then Senator Miller, and then Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. This will uh, only take a moment if you would come back to the. Uh, <laughs> I knew this. Uh, as you know, um, there there has been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, I think it was Debold um, company, their relationship to the president and uh, the administration, and supposedly comments about um, helping to ensure uh, that the president was reelected. In your world in your environment. Uh, have you heard any of this kind of discussion? Do you know people who work for Debo? Uh, do you have any sense of any um, actions that may have been taken? I don't know anything about that at all. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Senator Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. I suspect people will attack you in terms of your credibility. Could you restate once again your, your credentials? Uh, I'm a programmer. I work for NASA, work for ExxonMobil, work for um, Florida Department of Transportation, and other elements of my story, because this company, well, let's get into it. Why not? <laughs> this company also, they have NASA contracts, and they were basically downloading tons of information, I mean, gigabytes worth, and handing them off to this little Chinese guy named Henry Ni, nee, and it didn't seem right. And you know, he was hacking things, and I wrote a program for DOT that allowed contractors to send their information into DOT. And he was kind of the quality assurance guy for software. He put a wiretapping module in the program that went out to the contractors so that it actually sent everything they sent back to Yang. So I reported all this, and just last March, I think, he was arrested for attempting to send anti-tank missile chips to the capital of Communist China. So, if that's correct, this is such a small thing. <laughs> of course, I think he only got a $100 fine. And no time. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman Stephanie Tepps jones Thank you. Thank you. We're, we are now going to... Uh, back to the public testimony. Kyle and Cliff was questioning Clint Curtis. The, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, John Conyers, who ordered the FBI to investigate the crime, uh, was chairing this meeting. He chaired a meeting in, in, the, in the Capitol uh, a lot of people testified, a lot of congressmen, congress pe uh, people were there, and he chaired this meeting in Ohio. It was supposed to happen in the State House in Ohio, but the Republicans controlled the State House and wouldn't allow it. So it happened in the city council chambers in Columbus, Ohio. John Conyers was chairing it, and we had gone through a fair number of witnesses, but not this witness. Jesse Jackson was sitting next to me, and he turned to me, he said, what, what happened to your dynamite witness? And I said, John Conyers won't allow the witness to testify while he's chairman, because Tom Feeney is on the House Judiciary Committee, and he doesn't want to embarrass a member of his committee. Jesse Jackson said, I'll take care of that. He gets up from the table, goes up to the... John, John Conyers and asks him to recuse and leave the podium. And then a state senator takes the podium. And that's how the questions that were able, the questions were able to be asked. That, that testimony was able to be given. And talk about an indictment of the system, you know, starting in 2000, there it is. That was Jesse Jackson did that. Pardon me? That was Jesse Jackson that broke the ice to make that happen. Yeah. 
I want to say what happened to uh, Clint Curtis after he made this testimony. First of all, he lost his job, obviously, and nobody would hire him. And he spent about two years uh, doing boxes in Safeway. Mm -hmm. wow. And while going to law school to try to defend himself the next time he does something. And also someone shot his dog. Mm -hmm. And then the detective who was looking into this, <gasps> Lemmy. State of Florida investigator. Yeah, he came to look into this whole thing. And he uh, was found dead in his hotel room. There's a documentary movie about this. Yeah, there is. Murder, Spies. Murder, Spies, and Voting Lives. Thank you. With, uh, um, but there were no pictures of the body, the corpse allowed by the police at first. And later, there you could see both strangle marks as well as, uh, I think it was two gunshots. And um, he had written, supposedly, a scrawled note to his wife that night saying, I'm so sorry, I really want to uh, exit this planet. After he had had a very loving talk with his wife saying, you know, how he really felt he was at the edge of making a real discovery. And it was also a few weeks before his daughter's wedding. Mike, oh, right. Oh. And the other thing that's not in the film, but it's in uh, Clint Curtis's book that he wrote, is that uh, Clint Curtis was driving along the highway and he had a Mercedes. And he was being followed by a suburban, black suburban van. And a, uh, what do you call it? Utility vehicle. And the, uh, all of a sudden, his hood comes up like this. Wow. And he was able to look around and, and recover and not die. But he was, there was an attempt on his life. There's no question. This is, this is an attempt on his life. Wow, wow. And uh, we're going to hold questions a little bit so we can proceed. Um, but make a note of them. You know, don't forget them. Okay, because we got to catch up. Um, uh, so, um, so dealing with issues around elections can be dangerous business. Okay? And the next thing we want to show you is the man in the middle. And this is, um, this is something that happened in 2008, and I want to let you know that I was uh, uh, working with both Cliff and, uh, and Bob, as well as Brett Kimberlin of, uh, well, he now calls it uh, Protect Our Elections. And, um, and we had the IP address of Mike Connell. And uh, when I really began to understand why uh, the uh, media doesn't want to show people up uh, is, uh, is that I sat in 60 Minutes with Brett Kimberlin showing all this data about, the, about emails and things like that. You'll see in the movie. And uh, 60 Minutes wouldn't touch this. And I'm not talking about after he died. I'm talking about before. And, and so, you know, these people are in business. And anything around election fraud is bad for business. Well, this sounds like a made-up story. One man rigging state elections to help his boss, President George Bush. After it's done, power players in Washington say, get rid of the guy. 45-year-old Michael Connell died Friday night after his plane crashed into this vacant house near Union Township in Stark County. Connell was a political power player in Washington, D.C. and in the White House. He actually had to cancel uh, two of his previous flights in the past few months alone uh, because of some kind of problems or because there was some suspicion that there was something uh, wrong with the plane. Mike Connell could have disclosed information that would have been absolutely de detrimental to the Bush administration, in particular, Carl Rove. In 2004, in Ohio, Mike Connell built the Secretary of State, J. Kenneth Blackwell's election night reporting system. He had been the one who had created the, the firewall in uh, Congress for the Judiciary Committee. He had created the email system for the White House, the infamous email system for the White House, where millions and millions of emails had just 
disappeared somehow. He was uh, vehemently anti-abortion. I think that a lack of scruples required to manipulate votes and to set up secret email servers and things like that, somewhat mitigated by this ideological passion to save the babies. Apparently, Connell was a real believer and really did believe in the Republican Party because he was a uh, strict Catholic, uh, and he thought that he was saving the children, saving the babies. He was a true ideologue and not just a power junkie. Stephen Spoonamore investigates bank fraud and uh, computer fraud. He has looked at what happened in Ohio. I do not believe George Bush won. I believe Kerry won, and I'm a member of the GOP. It is uh, his belief that what happened in Ohio was a man in the middle attack, that the, uh, the numbers that were reported on the website frankly have nothing to do with the actual way that people voted. The kingpin, I thought, was probably sitting somewhere in the middle on the high speed line. And the kingpin is a computer with a person sitting at it that doesn't just steal the information and then they use it later like we saw. It's a person who has on board their kingpin computer the code and instructions for the Secretary of State's office and the code and instructions for a county tabulator. Instead of this happening, this happens. So at 9 o'clock in the evening, Carrie's leading in Ohio. And the kingpin is watching these results go through. And this operator is sitting here at a company called Smart Tech Solutions. We now know this office had a backup system, election night reporting system, with Smart Tech. And, and remember, when I speculated this, everyone said, that's ridiculous, that's completely impossible. Well, we now found out that not only was I right, we know where it was sent. We didn't just have it introduced, it was designed into the Secretary of State's office that they could switch the control from their computer talking to the counties to have a smart tech do it. And then we found out who owned it, and then we also found out it's also doing Carl Rove's email. <laughs> like, that's brilliant. And he has talked to Mike Connell, the guy who actually uh, created the system that was used to report the results on election night in 2004 in Ohio. I, I know Mike, and, and I like Mike. Mike and I share a lot of values. He knew uh, Connell personally and outed him, named him. So he was subpoenaed for a deposition in this election fraud case. Once the subpoena became public, Mike Connell began to fight uh, the subpoena. Uh, we received an uh, anonymous tip that Rove had threatened Mike Connell. He was, in fact, sitting for his deposition on the Monday before the 2008 presidential election. At times, uh, Mike would, would look to his lawyer when he really didn't want to answer a question. He was looking, looking at him to, you know, to raise an objection. I asked the question of what role uh, he had in smart tech uh, being part of the, uh, the Secretary of State's uh, computer system for election night in Ohio 2004. And his initial response was that, well, I don't recall that I had, that I did anything to influence that. And then I asked him the question, uh, what what subcontractors did you have under your contract with the Secretary of State's office? And at that point, he said, oh, I, I think it, I may have had Smart Tech as a subcontract under my contract. During one of the breaks, I had the opportunity to talk to him. And I warned him not to fly his plane. His response was to, you know, it's kind of scoff and roll his eyes. And he mainly was kind of looking out the window in the law office we were in, looking at Cleveland. And, and I talked a little about his family, but mainly he talked about, you know, how busy he was and how, what a imposition it was to be brought in uh, uh, for a deposition. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. Blixen and Blixen and all his reindeers pulling on the reins. Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright. So hang your stockings and say your prayers, cause Santa Claus comes tonight. In December, just prior to Christmas 2008, Mike Connell, who had been an accomplished private pilot, 
was on his way back from a meeting in D.C., back to Ohio, where he lived for his company's annual Christmas party. Mike Connell never made it to that Christmas party. We had a, a single engine, four occupant uh, plane uh, crashed here in this residence. We have a single occupant that has, DC, has been deceased. You can hear the engines cutting on and off, cutting out, and then you heard a big bang. A lot of folks have shouted conspiracy theory that uh, his plane was sabotaged. And in fact, in the weeks leading up to that crash, there were uh, signs that he had been warned, that he had been threatened, uh, perhaps by Karl Rove himself, that he, Mike Connell, should take the fall for what happened in 2004 in Ohio. And there was a lot of question about the Karl Rove's relationship both to him and to his untimely death. There are quite a bit of oddities that have to do with his crash. Protocol is that you rope off the crash site and post a watch, essentially, and you conduct the investigation during the daylight. And that wasn't done. They brought in lights. They removed the plane. Everything was done in two hours. They were in and out. The plane is gone. As much of the uh, parts of Connell that they could find easily under the lights, those were taken away as well. But uh, again, his wife came out the next day and found bits of him lying around. That's pretty uh, unorthodox, I think, for federal crash investigations. His sister believes that uh, it was, in fact, murder. His wife now seems to believe something very strange went on. She was able to get his backpack back, which had everything in it except the Blackberry, which she says he used to take everywhere. Was it murder? <laughs> At this point, we don't know. Stephen Spoonamore had said to me long before that deposition, Cliff, you realize the people we're dealing with, whack people. In September 2009, investigators received an anonymous letter with a tip that Mike Connell's plane had been sabotaged, along with a redacted report detailing the operation in military shorthand. Mike Connell was described as NST, a national security threat. The return address did not exist, and the name on the letter was Mark Felt, the man known as Deep Throat, who had died the year before. We can't really prevent them from trying to steal an election, but we can prepare people for that happening so that when and if it does happen, they won't simply keel over and feel defeated and like crawling home to die. So all of us were involved with this and uh, with the lawsuit, you know, like you come up and talk. And uh, just before, during the year before he died, I was involved with trying to get Bishop Gumbleton in Chicago to persuade Mike Connell to not change votes as a way of saving babies. That was my little task. And, you know, it never turned out. But I was right there when uh, Cliff and I and Bob, we all sat for dinner and we heard from Spoonamore, these people, they whack people, and I just, like, discounted it. Who, who are these really? people? Who, who are these people that whack? These people that whack people, the people, you know, who arranged for him to be killed. But who are those? Whoever they are. Well, well they, it was postmarked was from Blackwater. Thought to be an address, you know, around the intelligence community. It, even if you look today at who's involved in this, for example, we'll show we'll go into this later. Uh, for example, Titan L L7. You may know them from torturing and raping kids with khaki. You've seen a rock for sale, right? Uh, the guy who controls Seidel, also. I was uh, was a former uh, on the board of that company, Titan. Uh, it looks like the security industrial complex is real interested in uh, voting. That's what's happening now. This is a map of the, it, the title is Roadmap to Karl Rove's Empire of Election Fraud. Is that online? <coughs> Pardon me? Is that available online? Yes, it is. And uh, it's got a, it's got a, ve a very large uh, group of people here, uh, but uh, Karl Rove is uh, Karl Rove 
is described as the guy who carried uh, George Herbert Walker Bush's uh, uh, briefcase when, he, when George Herbert Walker Bush was director of the CIA. So Karl Rove was in a position to learn the techniques used to overthrow governments, to uh, corrupt elections overseas, by, as, as uh, Bob described as benign operations. Uh, and assassinations are part of our history, our country's history. Well, I, I want to stand. Uh, uh, we, tr we train CIA people to, to, to do assassinations. This is part, and this is part of a congressional record, right, Bob? So, uh, the, uh, anyway, what I want to underscore is Mike Connell has it, it, been described as a religious guy. He was, Spoonamore said, he was a personal friend. He, he went to church every day. He said uh, a prayer at every meal. Catholic. And when he was deposed, he had been instructed to take the fall. And when, when he was asked about the smart tech situation, had he wanted to take the fall, he would have admitted, yes, I'm responsible for smart tech being in that contract and having that role. And he denied it. All right, so he denied he would not take the fall, and that's why he was assassinated because they knew that in in, in the further investigation and so on, he was not going to take the fall. And what does that point to? And, and he said, "They put they put Mike they put Smart Tech in my contract." In other words, he was set up to take the fall if they were caught. He wouldn't take the fall, and by denying his role in putting it there. He was putting the finger on Karl Rove and Ken Blackwell. So much focus on Ohio, and yet the one part of the story what we're not talking about, maybe the biggest part of the story, Ohio's voting machines. Already there are major concerns that the electronic voting machines here, as well as an electronic software patch that's been placed on voting machines in the northern part of the state by Secretary of State John Husted, could cause all kinds of problems. According to the Free Press, Election Systems and Solutions, ES and S, they installed software patches that will affect 4,041,000 registered voters, including those in metropolitan Columbus and Cleveland. A story you haven't heard much about, right? More well, uncertified and untested software for electronic voting systems, they are presumably illegal under Ohio law. All election systems, hardware and software, it has to be tested and certified by the state before being put into use according to Ohio's revised code 3506. By unilaterally deeming this new software experimental, Secretary of State Houston was able to have the software installed without any review, inspection, or certification by anyone. Again, that according to the free press. It's a very big story here. These software patches are only the beginning, though, of the questions surrounding Ohio's voting machines. One of the most surprising revelations is how closely Governor Mitt Romney is connected to the machines being used right here in Hamilton County. Last week we investigated whether or not those machines could actually be hacked, whether the votes could be manipulated. Here's a look at that reality check. <laughs> 2012 could be the most unique presidential election in history in at least one respect. How many times in history has one of the candidates for president actually been connected to the company that owns the voting machines? Here's the backstory. Heart Inner Civic is an Austin-based voting machine company, and its clients include Hamilton County, Ohio, which administers elections here in Cincinnati. In fact, Hamilton County is only one of two counties in the entire state that use Heart Inner Civic. The other is Williams County. It's in the northwestern part of the state, a very small county. Hamilton County, though, is very important. Hamilton County, which went to Obama in 2008 and Bush in 2004, is believed that it could be the one that decides the winner of Ohio. And Ohio, more than any other state, will likely decide the presidency. Hart has had voting machines in Hamilton County since 2007. So suffice to say, Hamilton County is really, really important. So how do the voting machines play here? The Ohio website Free Press has reported a key investor in Hart is HIG Capital. Seven HIG Capital directors are former employees of Bain & Co., the same Bain & Company where Mitt Romney was CEO before leaving in 1984 to found Bain Capital. So definitely some connections there. But according to Salon.com, HIG Capital has gone even further, contributing $338,000 to the Romney campaign this year, 
More importantly, they announced their investment in Hart, the voting machine company, a month after Romney formally entered the presidential race. Four HIG executives have been identified as Romney bundlers by the independent watchdog group, the Sunlight Foundation. Okay, so clearly HIG Capital are Romney supporters, and they became major investors after Romney announced his bid for president. But even if they wanted to, could Hart, InterCivic, actually tamper with the voting results? Well, actually, they might be able to. In 2007, when Hart and two other voting machine companies began providing services in Ohio, the Secretary of State's office conducted a study called Everest to determine just how trustworthy the machines are. And here's what they found about Hart. Quote, the researchers concluded that virtually every ballot, vote, election result, and audit log is, quote, forgeable and otherwise manipulatable by an attacker with even brief access to the voting systems. Now, there is a long list of problems with heart machines, too long for this report, but researchers also found that the heart voting system violates, they say, a basic isolation tenet of security engineering. Compromise of a single precinct provides materials to compromise any precinct and the election headquarters. They also found that the auditing features were vulnerable to a broad range of attacks that can corrupt or erase logs of election activities. So what this means to you, well, first of all, let's be clear. We're not saying that the Romney campaign will cheat or has any plans to cheat on November 6th. But regardless, there is a huge problem here, one that transcends any one candidate. And the answer to that problem is transparency, a written record of every vote cast, a hard copy record, one that can't be changed by hackers or by software companies, one that can be verified and then recounted easily and clearly after the election. Well, uh, just how this segues into now, Hard InterCivic, uh, which counts all of uh, Orange County and a few isolated votes in, uh, in uh, counties in California, is tied together with ESNS with this company that has really come to the fore, CIDL, which is based in Barcelona, Spain. And we'll go over this, but it has connections with the CIA with National Defense, with Booz Allen, Hamilton, and uh, so... I think you're doing a great job of making the sale, but what do you suggest we and you Well, do? we're going to start now, okay? So, do you want to start with the exit poll? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the exit polls real quick, and then make some obvious suggestions. Great. And, the suggest, and we suggest those of you, there were some people who didn't want to be on our mailing list, if you want to keep updated on microphone. Sam. Oh. Sam microphone. Some people here who came didn't want to be on our mailing list. It, we suggest that you decide to join our mailing list because if you want to keep updated with what's going on, you will be able to do it. Through, and then this is, oh yeah, this is the the web address of the Institute for American Democracy and Election Integrity. And we are going to be both doing a lawsuit and a uh, and a citizen-based exit poll within the next week. But we may have to do them again in November with uh, Paul Manafort heading up Trump's campaign and having stolen the uh, you know the revolution the, the, in the Ukraine and being involved in 04, along with Mike Connell, who you saw. First of all, those are the projected Vernie Loss votes from uh, uh, from the unadjusted exit polls. And Cliff's going to talk about uh, uh, stuff like the lawsuit, and the uh, and I'll talk about the exit poll project. But but again, most of you uh, are familiar with this. Yeah, the you have the Sanders vote and the Sanders unadjusted exit poll vote, right? So you can see uh, the projections, except in Oklahoma, uh, and that's a real curious one. First of all, there's a 95% confidence interval, right? 95 uh, times out of 100, we can say these are going to fall within the margin of error. So in 20 elections, uh, Bernie was due one where he did better than predicted. But here's the odd thing. Oklahoma is the only one where state officials program, although the source code's proprietary, it's actually put into place by state officials and not private companies. 
um, who bring in experimental patches. So uh, it may suggest that they had overcompensated for a bit of a steal and you're actually getting a real vote uh, because state officials do it instead of private contractors. Uh, again, uh, you know, Vermont, 45%, 45.8% likelihood. There's about a quarter. But if you begin to look, almost all of it is shifted, even in small amounts, towards Hillary. But you get down to some of these states here, you know, Texas, where there's a 4.2% difference. It's outside the margin of error. And the chances of that happen, you know, are, uh, you know, 3%. You go farther. What are the chances of the Arizona result? That, zero. The probability that that would occur in reality is absolutely uh, zero. And they, they use the time-honored technique, uh, which in the book, uh, you know, how many of you have gone out and looked at your machine allocation report, a public record? In many of these areas, if you did, you'd have found out that they had closed, right, 70%. They'd gotten rid of 70% of all the machines in closed precinct places. So you have these, uh, the, they're supposed to be one for 100 registered voters. In Ohio, they did one for three, 1,300 registered voters in Kenyon uh, College uh, in 2004, creating a 13-hour line. But there's people who actually study line analysis and can tell you how to create chaos simply by shorting machines. So take a look again in Alabama, 6.1% uh, uh, again difference from the exit poll. Uh, the exit poll said he was getting 26%. He gets a little under 20. What's the likelihood? In, in reality, it's so far outside the margin of error, uh, it, it's not probable. Uh, Georgia, the same thing. 99%, again, uh, in Mississippi, you can see over and over again where, you know, the likely, the shift is all going in one way, which indicates someone's cheating, right? If it was some sort of random error, pro you would expect the cheating to go in both directions, right? You'd expect Bernie, you know, to have the one and Hillary to have one. And if things are going bad, and there's 12 of them, you'd expect 6 and 6, or 5 and 7. This is what we used to call the red shift, which usually only occurred for the Bush family. When they're, you know, literally, first time George Herbert Walker Bush running in 88 and 92, and then with George W. Bush in 2000 and 2004. What used to be the red shift has emerged as the Clinton shift. And I can't tell you what... You know, we have no proof Clinton's doing it. Okay. So in that scenario. But there's a variety of things uh, that can be done in these situations. Number one, right, the whole notion of video the vote. Uh, uh, and, of course, all of you uh, need to be outside the polls or inside the polls as poll workers. Somebody told me they were going to be a poll worker. How many in here are going to be poll workers? You need to make sure you hang on to the manual. You also need to know uh, where, where the number is for the Bernie people so you can call them. Uh, the Ohio vote in 2012 was saved by people in the Bay Area. Richard Tam and uh, his group essentially watched our computers in Columbus, Ohio and took uh, screenshots and we found that the computers went down in Cleveland uh, and in, again, Warren County because people in the Bay Area called us up and said, get, and we had flying squads, literally lawyers, people with cameras, tweeters running in and asking officials, why is the computer down? Because usually the computer goes down before it comes back up mm. with funny numbers. Mm. Right? Yeah. So a variety of that uh, uh, can be done uh, uh, in, in the process. And not only that, uh, Cliff is going to be uh, tell you about a lawsuit uh, that we intend to file prior to this election. And Lori will mention the other project, uh, the exit poll project. 
But also you need to look at whatever your Secretary of State's doing. Have you looked at all the directives and the advisories? Uh, you'd be surprised uh, what's in there. And there's also another suit he can talk about. Go ahead. Why is no anonymous more? The anonymous is going to be involved in their death? Well, anonymous, if it's going to be involved, uh, they'll send you the announcement. But, but again, we don't advocate that because we're, we're not involved in any illegal hacking. And if it's involved, we know nothing of it. That's my official okay. Okay. pronunciation. Okay. Cool. Definitely official. <laughs> Um, the um, uh, I, so um, let's see. Why don't you talk about the lawsuit first? Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Bob and I have been in state and federal court over this problem since uh, 2004, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the time since 2004, we've been in federal, federal court or state court. In 2012, we were in both federal and state court at the same time on election day. And, as, and we had the, uh, one of the top witnesses, top experts from the mm -hmm. National Security Agency as our expert witness on this problem that was described on Fox News about these illegal patches being on the computers. Mm -hmm. And we, we put the spotlight on it, and in the courtroom on election day, the judge said, if there's a problem with the numbers, if the f numbers look funny, you come back in to the courthouse and we'll talk about who pays for the audit. Because what we said is, that because the patches are already attached, the only way to uh, <coughs> catch the fraud is by doing an audit. And because these perpetrators of this fraud calling this an experimental patch that they put on 30% 30 uh, 30 of the uh, county tabulators um, is, 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 is to have them pay for the audit, not the, not the citizens, to pay, them pay for the audit. Wait, why on earth would they approve an experimental patch? Well, an experimental under law, you're allowed one experimental patch in one precinct. They, they were going to put it in 44 counties, they got it on 30 counties, before a Republican member of the Secretary of State's office contacted me and blew the whistle. Mm. All right, so on, so on election night, I mean, what happened in the courtroom happened in the courtroom. We were keeping the FBI informed every step of the way. And, and election night, the FBI was in the Secretary of State's office. All right, the FBI probably also had wiretaps. 2012? 2012. All right, so... On election night, Carl Rove is on Fox News. They call the election in Ohio for Obama. And Carl Rove says, wait a minute. All the votes aren't in yet. You're, it's premature. And he basically goes into a fight with, with the Fox News people. And their experts come out and say, no, Carl, we looked at it, the numbers. Are and here's what's the real story. And it's written up in Washington Spectator that... that no one told Carl that the fix was off because the scrutiny was on. Mm -hmm. All right. So can, I, can I just say something present time about the lawsuit? No, I'll, I'll talk okay, about Okay, so you've done it. Stop yeah. trying that. Time. All right. Oh, that's the, all, right the, all right, my point is when I talk about a lawsuit, I'm not, this is not a fiction. I'm talking about we have been doing this and we are, we are doing it now. And we are filing, filing a lawsuit which will uh, put the spotlight on these exit polls. We, anou we announced we were going to file such a lawsuit to compel the news media to report the actual exit poll results so that the public would know if there's apparent fraud. And guess what the media did? They canceled the exit poll. You're going to sue us to make us make it public? Or we just won't do it. And that's why Lori and, and Bob are organizing a citizen exit poll. But we're also going to file a lawsuit. And the lawsuit is going to demand that all of the exit polls, 24 exit polls, showing the fraud, now be public, that, that be published. That they stop suppressing the evidence of crime. Yeah, really. 
All right. Woo! Secondly, we're going to. We now have. We have the 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 guy who was investigating the fraud in the 2004 Ohio election, who documented in a book this thick, not only with precinct voting data, but actual ballots, a DVD of the actual ballots that were manipulated. Wow. Mm. He has been investigating all of these primaries. We have identified which precincts in this country the fraud has occurred, and we will be going into court with a demand to inspect the ballots. We will digitally photograph the ballots, and then we will have ballots. We can count them. We can do it publicly. Everybody can observe or participate. You want to recount them yourself to check it? We'll have them. The, the, the fix is on. They've done it. They've done it. They've stolen again, 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 again. They're serial uh, uh, vote thieves. And we've got the evidence. We've got the know-how. We've got the experts. We've got the mechanism of courts that understand the problem, and we're going after it. We're going to be filing a racketeering lawsuit. There you go. Under the Ohio rac racketeering laws, the strongest in the country, and we can bring in every state. Our, our RICO statute is, is coextensive with the federal RICO statute, but it's much more aggressive in allowing us to go back in time, and it's much a much stronger RICO statute. So they're nailed. Wow. So what I can say to you as a lawyer, I will represent you as a lawyer, in my opinion, Hillary Clinton has been used for the purpose of scuttling Bernie Sanders' campaign for president. She's being used. And, and, but they've, but the, they, they've been caught. It's obvious. It's just like Bernie Sanders when he talks about the system is rigged. Uh, it, the elections are rigged. The evidence is clear. Everybody's going to see it, and the game is over. Bernie's, yeah. Bernie's, Bernie has won, in fact, and he will win officially before the uh, in, uh, the Republican convention. Yes, sir. You you've seen the clip of um, on election day. As soon as they are able to report the results, they're going to say that Hillary Clinton has enough delegates. She's done, stop <laughs> counting, it's all over, and everything is for naught. Is there a way that we could stop that? I'm sorry if I've gotten too far away from your question. From your People can say anything they want, but the facts are facts, and the facts are coming out, and there's no way the, Repub the Democratic Convention is going to nominate somebody on the basis of obviously stolen votes. And that the facts are coming out, and that's the fact. My apologies. Let me, let me say my Go ahead. The media will, will create a fait accompli. Will try to create a fait accompli. The, the, and and that, the question is, how do you we are the suing, fait accompli? We are suing the media as being complicit in the crime. They, they, are, they are acting as accessories after the, after the fact. They are covering up evidence of criminal activity. It's a crime. And this is so, going to be uh, submitted by June 6th, so it's coming up really quickly. And uh, let me take a moment to talk about the exit polls. So, um, you know, one of the things, both projects that we're doing, and Sam, if you would go to trustvote.org, please do. Um, you can keep in touch with this by going to trustvote.org, and we have some little sign somewhere that was, there it is. Mm. And you can donate to either of these efforts, okay? And money be, will be well used if you want to give a big donation that's tax deductible. And uh, the, um, so the, the two ideas, the, the two actions we're taking is one, we are um, doing this lawsuit. And then secondly, we're setting up a citizen-based exit poll in both Northern and Southern California. We, we've pulled this together within 10 days. And um, we will, uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, website of um, the Institute for American Democracy and Election Integrity, and we have a simple little uh, 
email thing called uh, trustbook.org. Can we make Put it smaller? To the top so you can see. Yeah. There. Okay. And trustvote.org is going to have information on the lawsuit as it's submitted and, and also for those people who want to go and participate in an exit poll, we have both volunteer and paid positions in uh, n Northern California and in Southern California there's more volunteer. Could you turn now to the donate uh, slide? And then, and then later to the uh, contact slide. So if you notice, uh, they're both here. with donate buttons, uh, the other, other donate button's a little lower, see? So you can go to trustvote.org. You can also give money today in our beautiful little heart bowl, a gift of the heart <laughs> today. And then if you could now, Sam, go to the contact uh, section. So uh, there's a there's a slide that should say contact underneath. Now you can see here this is our contact page. So if you scroll back up again, Sam, you'll see no and a little further down. It'll tell you, you say I want to participate in the citizen exit poll, and this is June seventh. But there will be a training before that, and there are some paid positions. Not not ha not highly paid, but and some volunteer. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to just make a suggestion. If anybody's signing up to volunteer, you can also add if you have any other like if you have a vehicle where you can yeah, that's uh, drive good. others. If you have any special skills, any other good anything idea. to contribute beyond just showing mm -hmm, up mm -hmm. and your general availability. Are you available the entire uh, day of the poll polls? Or are you only able to do a four-hour shift? Um, Information like that. Yeah, and the four hour shifts will definitely be volunteer. Yes? There's a question about um, filing by June 6th and completed by July 18th. Is that the goal of this? Um, well, uh, Cliff, maybe you can give the time, time period on the lawsuit. When do you expect to have them respond? Yeah, obviously, this is a big undertaking. And it's going to be in a phase in a fa phases, but, but it will be launched before the California primary, and and the spotlight will be on the activity will you know the spotlight will be on in terms of the full parameters of the racketeering uh, claim. Uh, it's going to be a little later, and it's going to be as soon as we can get it done. But it's going to it's going to take a and little hopefully bit. before July. But before convention. the convention, it's mm -hmm. going to be filed. We expect that before the convention, the actual unexpurgated exit polls will be for the entire primary will be available for public view. And and can you imagine if the if the media says, well, we're not going to report that, and when they're the, they're they've been compelled to produce this information in a in a in a court proceeding? I mean, this is coming well, this out. This happens all the time. I don't see how you think it's going to be different. The, the media is constantly burying court cases, like, you know, the federal government convicted of conspiracy to kill MLK, that wasn't reported. But we have very aggressive yeah. discovery rules in our court system. Very liberal uh, discovery rules. And, and the complaint itself, which I hope you send all over the internet, is going to bring in Steve Friedman from Penn. It's going to bring in people like uh, Beth Clarkson, the statistician of Wichita State, Richard Charnin, that it's going to lay out exactly what happened, and you're going to have some of the best mathematicians and some of the leading academics and maybe say maybe. under oath that this is election tampering. I mean, so that the complaint <coughs> itself will carry the history of exactly what happened to Bernie Sanders in this campaign. And it's not just these exit polls, it's this precinct data where we are going to be able to say where, where the votes were stolen. And it's in the African-American, Latino, predominantly uh, uh, districts in urban and university. Lo locations. And, the university. That's where, and, and we're going and we're going to be going for the ballots. We're going to be digitally photographing the ballots. This is no longer is, uh, uh, the, all, all the hiding is over. We're, we're going to be in court, we're going to have discovery, and, and it's all coming out. Mm. Yeah. 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 So, so I'm saying that if 
that this fraud yeah. didn't happen, Bernie Sanders would be uh, the winning the candidate, the presumptive the winning candidate in the Democratic yes. Party. Yes. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just, just so I understand this better, the the, the lawsuit's going to be against so many uh, the, the the media companies that have actually produced and paid for the exit polls. Is that correct? The, the, as the, well as the, Edison the, Research. Okay. And certain the people that have conducted public them as well. officials. Yes. Okay. So and, and so the, the, you got numerous defendants here. You're suing a Franklin County. <laughs> Franklin County. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the. Uh, and, 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 and your, stand, your standing is, how do you have standing here to do this? I mean, who are you representing? We have stand, we, I'm, I'm, the details of this are, are not finally decided. We want to have, we want to be in a court, uh, we want to be in a court that is already familiar with the problem. And there's a federal court and there's a state court, both of which are familiar with the problem. In the federal court, the plaintiff to relate our current case to the case that's before the federal court before, the plaintiff is, a, is an entity called King Lincoln Neighborhood, Bronzeville Neighborhood Association, which is an African American community, and they, they were the plaintiff in this earlier case. And they have standing because this has been a violation under 1980, the 1983 section of the uh, Civil Rights uh, okay. statute. And uh, there's no question they have standing. Uh, the the uh, and and that case pended for quite a while, and that case is uh, can be re refiled, and then it will be expanded to add additional plaintiffs, to add additional defendants, and uh, as an amended complaint. If it's filed in the state court, in the state court, Bob Fatrakis was the plaintiff in the 2012 case, and Bob for, Bob Fatrakis has standing on multiple bases. He is the editor-in-chief of the Free Press, which is a commercial, uh, it's, it's a non-profit, but it's an organization that's engaged in news reporting. And, and Free Press has been prejudiced by, by the, by the cover-up of the major media. He's been ridiculed. His, his newspaper's been ridiculed uh, be, because they're covering up the crime, which he's reporting. He's got standing on that basis. Bob Fatrakis is co-chairman of the Green Party in, in the state of Ohio. And he's able, he has uh, standing in, in that sense. Bob, Bob Fatrakis is a candidate for political office, as an independent, is a Green Party candidate for political office. He has standing on that basis. Bob Fatrakis is an all-round Renaissance man who has standing on at least three or four days. You think you're going to so be able I, to get, you think you're going to be able to get uh, some form of injunctive relief in time to impact the election? Yes. And what's the base? I, the theory, the theory of injunctive relief is this: every day that you or I cover up a crime is is a crime, and and. Uh, to, you know, we will seek an injunction against the continuing cover-up of this information, this data. And so, so yes, we're going to file for discovery uh, under the civil rules. We will file for discovery, which has to be produced within 28 or 30 days, depending upon which court we're in. But we're also going to seek uh, injunctive relief, and we're going to argue that for the public to remain in the dark, during this critical period, for example, when the when the California, the biggest state in terms of votes, is voting, for them to be denied the knowledge of all this criminal activity that's been going on in every election up to this time, is 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 outrageous, and it's, it creates irreparable harm. The public has a need to know today that this is going on. Well, I don't think that the, the uh, she's not the one who's doing this. This is being done by this is being done by uh, this this. It's it's being done by people who do this professionally, 
And uh, she is being used because I don't think they really want her or think that she's going to be the ultimate uh, candidate uh, for president. But that's, that's, that's the way I see it. Karl Rove was uh, interviewed or wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal last week. And he said that Hillary's problem is the FBI primary. Mm -hmm. And he said that he believed that the, that the Republican convention would not nominate a socialist or someone uh, under investigation by the FBI. Mm -hmm. And that they would turn to someone... I'm sorry? The Democratic Party. I'm sorry, the Democratic, the Republican yeah. sorry, the Democratic yeah. convention. Yeah. Somebody uh, under investigation by the FBI. And that they would go to Biden or, or uh, Kerry. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just... That's Carl Rose uh, talking. Um, I'd like to say that having watched these organizations, I also believe that that Hillary is not actually doing the stealing. What I have noticed is that in pl certain places, Republicans choose the opponent for the Democrats. And Hillary is actually easier for Trump to beat. Right. But no, I think in, in, in my Republican view. circles, Bernie Sanders is widely viewed as more easy to beat. In which they circles? Yeah, the polls, the polls don't say that, polls. but the polls no, before the polls even are. the primaries are determined are... No. Not accurate. No. You can do caucus and Bush. If you go back in history, the pre-convention polls are not accurate. That changed. And my understanding is among Republican political operatives, when Bernie Sanders is widely believed to be much more uh, easily beat. That's why the right Well, way. I've looked differently and found different, different reports. Okay. I think it's debatable. So, well, that's not really well you can debate it's what you want. I mean, basically, you know, who's doing the shifting guys, is more likely yeah. this. And also, also, don't forget, you're asking about rational behavior from people that take their orders from a talking rock. These people are Christians. <laughs> no, but these people are not, you know, Christians. Well, some of them are. are you sure? They're, they're like the neoliberal elites. That's yeah. how I view Well, actually, you know, you've not got... Not the liberal elites. No, no neoliberal elites. No, this is... No, no, he means right wing. Right 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 no, you've got a point, though. Did you have a question, sir? Well, I have two questions. One, well, one is a statement that I've been out canvassing now in Marin for three. I've been canvassing seven days a week, and if anybody right. could possibly, yeah. if anybody could possibly volunteer any time, we need you more than ever right now. The Marin for Bernie office is running like, this weekend canvases three days a week, uh, and th this weekend Saturday, again? Sunday, Monday nine. Uh, but I've been talking. Uh, to voters in the Clinton camp, especially, um, really has been convinced that they Bernie cannot beat Donald because they're gonna and they're 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 fed this by the media and everything else and they believe that and they just end the story and uh, so that's my statement that we need to somehow just find the passion of Bernie Sanders and move just move the vote forward. And so my question is, is when Bernie becomes a Democratic nominee and when he is on the ballot in November, can Bernie, against the corrupt and rigged system of the election, the voting machines in Ohio and in the swing states, California is going to vote Bernie no matter what in November, but will the swing states be able to be won with these rigged machines? Once this lawsuit takes its course, the game, the, the, the cheating game is over. You know, we, we will be doing some things on our own, but the, we, the FBI and the Justice Department will be kept fully informed. And I expect, as the facts come out, as as uh, we, I believe we have honest, uh, an honest uh, Justice Department, an honest FBI, and there will be a prosecution of the people that are doing this. So it's it's over. That's but uh, just to let you know, we need your support in this. <laughs> That's impressive. We, we need your support, and there will be substantial, I believe, industry pushback on this. And also, Cliff, I have some concerns for your safety. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. Just say I mean, it. Yeah. Don't get it. Let me briefly say that I don't think Bernie's Mike, going to be caught Mike, in a fall. Microphone. Microphone. Okay. I don't think Bernie is going to be caught with the stripping of the voter rolls. I think they caught him unexpectedly early on. That's been done. 
They can't flip votes unless they first strip in these battleground states hundreds of thousands of voters. And Bernie's got enough people, as Obama did, to go out and re-register uh, the people. And if the people are registered, Bernie wins. Because when they do, the most they've ever done with this is about flipping five points. You can't do massive amounts. And you can only get there to 3%, a 3% uh, uh, percentage point flip, or a 5 if you've stripped hundreds of thousands of voters. Bernie uh, has the apparatus to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> Good. Good. I've heard that uh, in all the swing states, the governors are Republicans and the Secretary of State are Republicans. And so this obviously can be a problem. Mm -hmm. What do you think? None, none of them want to go to jail, and that's where we are. All right. Yeah, I just have a question about how long your lawsuit's going to take. Because you know they string these things out for years. I mean, I believe it's a long-term good, but how's that? I mean, the Supreme Court's in the next four years. It depends on this election. Okay, the, 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 here's the thing about lawsuits. Whether it's through the injunctive action or through the dis routine discovery. When I say routine, I mean we have a very liberal discovery process. The, the idea of the, of the court system, both state and federal, is to get the facts out. At each side is entitled to the evidence. And we're going to have aggressive discovery. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be uh, under seal. It's going to be public. So the facts are going to be out. And, and, the, and the, key, the key to this is not the, you know, what, what, are we, what is at the end of the rainbow? You know, what, what are the damages? What do we, what do we want? That's not, that's not what is important here. What's important here is getting the truth out now. And we can do it. Yes, sir. So I want to be an exit poll taker. And can you explain what I need and the counties that are threatened first. for Contra Costa, Santa Clara? Well, we what decided else? to do it in Contra Costa, Alameda, and, uh, uh, and um, Santa Clara. And uh, the, uh, what's going to happen is, first of all, we'd like you to register on contact, okay? Secondly, um, we will get in touch with you very early next week, probably um, right after Memorial Day. And there will shortly be a training. And uh, we have uh, three counties with uh, six different... Uh, uh, polling places it will be covered by four exit pollers. We have positions for three um, three different um, precinct managers in a county. That, that's a paid position. We probably have volunteer um, exit pollers. Uh, you know, if they can do uh, four to eight hours, the, the paid ones will definitely have to do eight to ten. And um, and what will happen is is we will get data that we can also submit about California. We won't have it like uh, you know California wide like Edison does, but it'll also be a chance to really learn about how an exit poll can can be happening, and we can provide it as additional material in your lawsuit. And you get a feeling for it, and I don't know if you want to say anything more about exit polls or whether it's been covered. Well, did you? I don't know. <laughs> the thing that I wanted to for a mic, can I have a mic? Yeah. The thing that I wanted to say earlier that I think is hasn't been said is that exit polls, when they don't match the vote, are not. They don't sub they can't be substituted for the vote, but they're an indication that an investigation needs to happen. So that's what we're going for is being able to have the evidence that there's a reason to do an investigation and not just certify the vote the vote count. Thank you. Very well said. And, and again, the exit polls in the northern area here uh, will be completely randomized, professional, uh, although limited. The ones in the South, the citizens' exit polls, uh, actually uh, are going for mass numbers 
And also, we're hoping... That's a different system. Yeah. Two it, systems it, down there. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, complementing that system <clears throat> is a new app on, uh, on phones uh, that could be admissible under law if we get over 50%. It's going, and it's open source application of uh, VoteCon, and it will, will be beta tested in uh, Southern uh, California. Do you have a URL for that or a Google search? It's democracycounts.org. And one real quick thing is to say that if anybody is going to participate on June 7th, you, of course, have to vote early. So either voting by mail early or going down to your local county registrars and uh, with your ID and, and voting there. And the other thing is is that um, any volunteers that were able to uh, mobilize are going to help support the, the, the hired and professional staff. <clears throat> so Great. asking friends and family and others to be and able to come. And you get a feeling for what it's like to be taking a hand in your democracy. You know? the, the more oversight, the better. Is voting by mail subject to the same kind of yeah. Um, it, it can be. Um, it's not, uh, you know, when I looked into vote by mail in Marin, they were, the, the ballots and how the ballots were taken from one place to another were not given that much oversight. Yeah. And, and there was a, a group of uh, Latino ladies down in the basement counting. The problems which we didn't bring up here is that I don't know about this registrar, but there's a push from the registrar to have the 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 votes that are counted by hand, like mail, to fit electronic totals. I don't know how much this new registrar is like that, but it's very common. Yeah, it's a different set of problems. Obviously, you have a paper trail, so in that way, it's it's more accurate uh, and less likely to fraud. The problems that we found with, with the mail-in ballots, couple of one, uh, is that a lot of the nursing homes in various areas of the country, if the Democratic machine is behind Hillary Clinton, uh, these assisted living homes often come in 97% as the Democrats have access and go in. Uh, and in areas where they're heavily Democratic, often people would show up and take the ballots and they would never get to the Board of Election. So it's a different set. Uh, and the other one is the mail-in. Uh, in many cases, the post office was holding up to 10,000 uh, mail-in ballots because the opposite party put one stamp on when it were required two. So yeah, there's some fraud there, but you can't do it with a click, with a, DR, you know, a DRE machine with no paper in it. In this case, you have paper. You just got to make sure it gets and, there. And in California, what I like doing the most is taking my ballot that I've marked up as a, I'm a permanent absentee ballot uh, person to the actual polling place. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the book that I wrote, it took six years, is the media as power brokers in presidential elections. Bill Moyers endorsed on the cover. So my question to you is, what are you doing about going to Baba Jelko at the Chronicle, Peter Fimreich, and getting what you're doing into the media now, right now? Amen. Um, Amen. We, we will be suing them. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to sue the San Francisco Chronicle? Well, no, the, the, the media consortium, we're suing them. We will be suing them. Uh, that's NBC, CBS, uh, Fox okay. News, uh, Associated Press. It's it's a it's a good group, okay. and, and that that will be news. Right. Don't sue any good man. Or... <laughs> and and I, I want to say, with respect to the exit poll or the lawsuit, both of them need more money. Um, we we need to um, to have donations to. Uh, fully do the exit. There's some money that's been raised already, but there's more that we need to have. So if you have something to donate to the exit poll or the lawsuit later, we'll need more money. So 
So how is it going to hold any legal steam if being a citizen exit poll? I mean, he mentioned that it's professional. Yeah, that's But how, you know, they so, can easily just say... Bob, do you want to speak people. to this? Yeah, that's a, good, uh, Bob, that's a question I really uh, wanted to know. Too. How, how are we going to make it seem like it's official? The, uh, if the people are going to... And, like, you and how me is it going to hold any legal steam was my question. If it's not professional... The California exit poll. Well, if the, the ones are randomized here and they'll, they'll undergo... Uh, scientific uh, standard procedures will disclose that uh, to the courts. You'll be able to see our sample, the survey, the technique, the end. They'll be able to look at the sum of the sum square divided by the sum of the square. Uh, they'll see how we randomize, how we came up with the numbers. So are you leading the exit poll? Or who's leading and, uh, uh, the exit poll is in a person that's done exit polls uh, in other uh, similar cities. Uh, and whose father is a very brilliant mathematician. By the way, we welcome any donations as you leave. And uh, the southern way, uh, the evidence uh, will be more likely if we beta text and we can get over 50%. It will not probably have the same value in the southern area unless we get over 50% of the respondents in those areas. But we're anticipating some of the areas we may be able to get you know, 90, 95 percent. Of the voters? Yes. Is that uh, uh, the person who's done this did it once before, and she had it certain precincts. So there'll be so much, uh, there'll be so many in the response, and the beta, the beta testing is actually designed to get in, in the court. It'll track, you know, who voted, uh, all of that will be recorded. And the bulk, the bulk of the ex, the bulk of the exit poll evidence will be the 24 Edison exit polls, mm -hmm. right. the best in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, one person has a question on here. It says, if, um, if we're suing the media, how is the, then why is the media then going to tell us that they're being sued? <laughs> I'm sorry. Like if if, if CNN is getting sued or Fox News is getting sued, are, are they going to say, hey, I'm being sued? I I we're only suing six of them, right? We're only suing, you know, the four networks, the Associated Press, and CNN. That's the election pool. Okay. So other other groups like Amy Goodman, I guess, and what else? Well, yeah, for all the other newspapers, San Francisco Chronicle, they're not being sued, right? The Columbus Dispatch isn't being sued. Mm -hmm. So, I think this uh, completes uh, Are we going to do a little bit of showing us the train? Well, all right, we can take there. a moment with that. Yeah. A bit of okay, us. so. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I, I just want to say one thing before you go to that. Go. I just want to say, right over here is a suburban house in Fairfield, Virginia in 2012. This was the, uh, the headquarters, the U.S. headquarters of CITL. And and when they we took a picture of them, they moved to a little office in Baltimore. Now they're in Barcelona, Spain, and also in Florida, and much bigger than before. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, is, uh, somewhat quick here. How many have heard of Seidel? Seidel, okay, a few of you. Seidel counted all of the overseas votes and American abroad votes in 2012. 36 states allow them to directly input into the state central tabulator. And once you do that, you own it, right? You can do whatever you want. So Seidel, if you go back, you look at things, not a capital has an interest in it. Uh, but I'm going to tell them, not a capital likes to hang around with the CIA nonprofit and develop uh, technology. Not a cap capital has an ownership interest in Carrier IQ. Anyone familiar with Carrier IQ? It's a third party app on your phone you can't get rid of. It's the one that turns your phone on without uh, letting you know and records you and videos you. They own that technology. Uh, care uh, uh, you can go online as some 17-year-old kid or so in his parents' basement. When he went through all his apps, he found one that you couldn't agree to and you couldn't get rid of without damaging your phone. That's Carrier IQ. Who owns it? Nada. 
who own, has an ownership in Seidel. Uh, again, uh, Balderton Capital, long thought to be a uh, intelligence uh, proprietary in Britain. This is British intelligence money right here uh, that's uh, invested as well. Over here is Vulcan, ownership interest. But they're always hanging around and have these relationships with these other companies. For example, here, here's the CEO of Seidel. He also, again, uh, facilitated the sale of GlobalNet to Titan, right? It's in the public and record. What's Titan again? Uh, you remember Titan? They're the ones that tortured people at Abu Ghraib with khaki. Titan L7, one of their uh, very famous story. Uh, one of them raped, uh, raped a, a young boy underage and wasn't even fired. That's Titan L7, right? Who facilitated the sale? The CEO of Seidel, who counts our vote. These people, through interlocking directorships, these people are based in Barcelona, Spain. And when we pointed that out in, in uh, uh, 2012, the Free Press pointed that out. How did we do it? Uh, we looked at the stock filings. Uh, we looked at the stock exchange. And uh, what they did after that, first of all, they said, we're not counting them in Barcelona. We're counting them in our U.S. headquarters. So we sent people to their U.S. headquarters. It was a private resident, uh, uh, resident in Virginia, not that far from Langley. Now, uh, so they bought up SOE. So now SOE is a software giant and Seidel. This is one-stop shopping. What can they do? Go to their websites. They don't hide this stuff. They will take your voter database and register it for you, right? If you signed up to vote for Bernie, they'll put you in the Libertarian Party or the American <laughs> Independence Party. They'll do that. Uh, they'll, they'll create your tablets. They'll train your poll workers. They'll monitor your social media to make sure you people have good election experiences. And they'll tabulate your vote for you. And they'll do your election night reporting. One-stop shopping for friends of the intelligence community. What happens when you digitally leave a footprint that you are pro-Bernie and you are pro-progressive? They have that data. We live in a world of mega and metadata and geospatial. That's PRISM. That's what we know from the NSA. That's what we know from the leaks from WikiLeaks and Snowden. They have that data. That's why I knew in Ohio they would go after the kids in the college towns at OU, at OSU. They knew they can tell from the demographics uh, who is who, who signed up, what their age is, and they have tremendous predictors. That's why they can strip with such accuracy and move people to the wrong parties. Is it a closed state? Then when you move them to a party they don't belong into, it's an open state, you strip them, and you know with tremendous precision. This came out of consumer selling goods, came out of the old Claritas zip code systems. They know who, exactly who to target. Yeah. And uh, what's been happening to Bernie's uh, databases? Uh, uh, <laughs> same thing that happened in Ohio. They stole the chair of the state's computer with all the new voter data. They stole the chair of the Toledo Democratic Party's uh, computer all over the states in major areas. The computers were stolen prior to the 04 election. You know, earlier in the campaign season here in, in mid-April, moving into the campaign moving to California, the canvassing data and the software program that would be used would often get glitchy around 5.36 6.30 p.m. Pacific time right when Bernie's team is canvassing. The more glitchy, the less data that they can collect. At uh, noon, 1 o'clock, when you're really not going to be doing it and there's not going to be a bunch of good evidence of, in the data, it would run fine. Yeah, yeah. So that would argue as targeted. It could be overloaded. Tar could be overloaded, yes. No, but they, that data, they have it. There's people that do nothing but traffic in this data, and they're very precise. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, are we adjourning? <laughs> All right. Thank you.
right, everyone. Thank you for watching and participating. And if you want to donate, I got all your questions answered. And here we go. We're gonna win this because we know we won already. Bernie is our man, and we are going to make him our president because he deserves it. <laughs> we won this fair and square. He won it fair and square, and that's it. We are. Um, Boots on the ground, go knock on doors, go make your phone calls, and yeah, any kind of evidence that you have regarding election fraud also that you've experienced in your neighborhood, a good thing to do would be to get that information uh, to us. I'm going to be creating a map, an interactive map on Google, where you can actually add your location and the issue that happened to you. So we can get that information for the lawyers to take in and compile so that we have tons and tons of evidence that absolutely proves this is a slam dunk steal for them, but a slam dunk steal back for us. And uh, yeah, hello, Bernie Sanders, president number 45. We love you and we're doing this all for you. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.